Is that your Dick Tracy card? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's my Dick. Meeting of the City Council to order. Will the City Clerk please call the roll? Mayor Johnston? Uh, here. Mayor Pro Tem Francina? Here. Councilmember Blatz? Here. Councilmember Haney? Here. Councilmember Wyrick? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Uh, we'll all rise. Uh, Randy, will you lead us in the pledge? Sure. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. First item of business is to approve the uh, agenda order. Uh, do we have any changes? No. Hearing none, uh, without objection, the uh, agenda is approved. Uh, we have a very pleasant ceremony now to proceed with. We've got, uh, well, <laughs> I'll save my remarks just a bit. Um, we have a presentation of recognition of the Nordoff High School varsity softball team uh, for winning the California Interscholastic Federation. <laughs> and uh, these young women uh, have been feted already down at the Board of Supervisors, which is a much larger room, so the logistics here, we're going to uh, just sort of improvise. But uh, Randy and Ryan are going to assist us, uh, so why don't we walk around to the other side, and I will join you. And uh, we have some uh, certificates of recognition and a proclamation. In fact, maybe I will read the proclamation from here. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I'll read the whole thing if you guys can stand that long. <laughs> it says, whereas the Nordoff High School 2019 varsity softball team has won the 2019 California Interscholastic Federation Southern Section Division Six Champions. First time, right, for the, <laughs> terrific. Uh, whereas the team was not ranked high when it entered the playoffs, but, but as it faced higher ranked teams from bigger schools with deeper resources, it turned training into action. And whereas two players were also named the all CIF players, senior captain and pitcher, Sydney, Sydney, did I pronounce that right? Mo Wimpy was named 2019 CIF Southern Section Division Six Pitcher of the Year. Whoa. 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 How about that? <laughs> And, let's see here, we're senior. And senior catcher, Taylor Erickson, was named 2019. <laughs> All CIF Southern Section player as catcher of the year. And for anybody who plays baseball or softball, they know how important those two positions are. You, you can't win a game, let alone a championship, without really top notch. Whereas the accomplishments has made the school history as the team's first CIF championship since the sport began at Nordoff High School in 1976. And whereas the team members also work to be their very best selves off the field, 99% of the players have a grade point average of 3.0 or higher. Mm. How about that? And in addition, uh, as good citizens this year, they collected two tons of food for the local food bank to help those in need in their own community. Okay, therefore, be it resolved that I, John F. Johnston, Mayor of the City of Ojai, on behalf of the City Council and the community, commend the Nordoff High School 2019 varsity softball team for winning the CIF Southern Section Division Six Championship dated this 11th day of June, 2019. Congratulations, everyone. Hey. So now we'll come around and see how we, uh, we have a few remarks from... Uh, <laughs> Celebration has begun. Exactly, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> you do one, you got to do all. Right. 
Hello, hello. Is it working? All right, so, um, so, for, so, so um, when we talk, we're supposed to keep this close to our mouths. I, I'm, I'm a, as Coach Rodardi knows, I'm pretty loud anyway, but uh, first of all, Don, congratulations. Don and I go back almost 14, 15 years. In fact, Don showed up um, and he was the cops for Jock police officer. Can't remember when, but it was, that's when we first met. And, uh, and that was his first involvement that I knew of in athletics at Nordoff High School. And he, uh, you just fit right in, Don. You just, it, you know, everything you did, you, 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 we all worked under Cliff Farrar, the winningest coach in Ventura County and in, uh, in his sport. Um, we all, sorry, games. And we, we just all grew and we all were nurtured by him. And he set certain standards within us. Um, and girls, that's, that's what you achieved this year, was the fact that um, you had a leader that one believed in you. You had a leader that showed you how to win. You had a leader that didn't waver. You had a leader that showed up every day. And so by demonstrating that, he gave you all the tools that was necessary for you to excel and achieve, and that's what you did. So you did exactly what you were supposed to do. And it was hard, and it was difficult, and it was trying. But you girls are just phenomenal. You're studs. You're, uh, <laughs> I, I know we don't use that term a lot when it comes to young ladies, but you're, you're winners. You're absolute winners. And you're winners in all aspects of who you are, not just as softball players. And that comes from your parents, that comes from coach, comes from coach's staff, and it comes from your community. And so um, I could talk forever, Don, and I could talk forever about him because he is just a great guy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand the mic over to Ryan. I'm going to give Don the coach's certificates, and when Ryan's done, we'll let Don pass these out to each of you, and then Don, if we would like you to hand the certificate out to each of you girls too. So again. Well, first of all, I want to say absolutely congratulations. This is a, not only your first championship, but I have uh, I've known uh, Coach O'Darty for a while now. I've uh, been supporting this softball team uh, by playing in their golf tournament every year, and I've gotten to hear about some of the accolades. And I got to tell you, it, we're not here just celebrating a championship, which is pretty cool. We're also here to celebrate how hard these women work in the community how much work they do for uh, out, out altruistically, not for themselves, by uh, volunteering their time, and the discipline and the, the work ethic that Coach Rodardi has instilled in them is why they're winning. But they're not just winning a championship today. They're getting rewarded because they are great community members as well. And it's not easy to do both. We're not here just celebrating that, but we want you to know from the city standpoint, we really want to thank you for putting in that extra effort and that extra time. And Coach Rodardi, we want to thank you as well for what you've done with this team, but also as they have shown leadership and examples of how every team can not only be victorious, but they can also be a real contributor to their community. And uh, for that, we want to thank you all. So congratulations. Okay. See, my voice is kind of, it's normally louder, but uh, today it's um, well, a fun weekend. Um, so, uh, Miguel, I'll, I'll introduce the players right now. I got uh, Morgan Albertson. Uh, Morgan is also a junior. We also have a freshman, Ariana Alonzo. Junior, Zoe Damianos. Sophomore, Emma Dialba. <laughs> Senior, Taylor Erickson. <laughs> Senior, Elizabeth Hermosillo. <laughs> Freshman, Hannah Ignacio. <laughs> Junior, Jenna Carlson. <laughs> Freshman, Alexis Kio. <laughs> Freshman, Alessandra Lucchesi, senior, 
Sydney Wimpy. Freshman Willow Williams. And senior Brianna Nichols. Uh, I really do appreciate you guys. I mean, you guys got a really busy schedule, and I really appreciate taking time and giving us acknowledgement. I mean, I'm, these group of kids, I'm always proud of. Every team I have, I'm very proud of them, and I'm especially this team. Um, the community service stuff we do, um, they look forward to it. We do this well before we start practice one. And they look for the coach when we do in the food drive. Coach, when are we going to go and do the feed the homeless? That's stuff they do. And when we go and feed the homeless, we do that after a practice. And they practice three hours. We do that five days a week. And they're wanting to go and do that after that on top of all the homework they have to do. So you know what? These kids are going to be pillars of your, your community. Um, and you know what? Couldn't be more proud of them. Um, also, I'd like to um, give the city um, one of our uh, batting helmets assigned by this entire team. Um, we really appreciate all that you guys do. Um, I know you guys got a great place you're going to display that at. Um, well, so We're going to give it to our city manager. Having him wear it to me. Also, I have two balls, and um, there were game balls, and I'd like to give one to um, Jim Fryhoff. Um, Jim's a, a dear friend, and uh, the second ball, um, fourteen years ago when I took over this job, we rededicated our field and named it after Peter Aguirre, and I have specific reasons why I did that. Um, so I know Jim, you're going to see Dina before I will. So could you give her this other ball, please? Well, I do thank you all for your time and your accolades that you've given. Um, really appreciate that. It's a great community we live in. Um, you want to give your coaching staff so we can meet them? Oh, yeah. Well, we got today, we got here uh, with uh, us as well as uh, Ben Rodriguez. Um, I think it is. And then we got uh, Tim up there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You. And part of your reward is you don't have to sit through a council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we'll let you guys slip out it or right. stick around if you want. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, so those girls are pretty much all born after 2000. 
Oh my god. That's what we were talking about earlier. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They're probably all born after 2000. After 2000. After the, the beginning of the uh, new millennium. They're all new millennium people. Yeah. Okay. So, Mayor, how do we top that? Huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't right. know. I, yeah. It's not exactly a visit to the White House, but to the, <laughs> but it is to the Smith Hobson House and the OI City Council. Well, you just get energized. Well, there are a lot less of them who refuse to go since it wasn't the White House. Being around <laughs> right. athletes, yeah, you just get exactly. energized. Yeah. Okay, uh, we now have our consent calendar, and I've had a request to pull uh, E and G. Are there any other uh, items that you'd like to yeah. pull off? If not, okay, with the exception of E&G, can I have a motion to approve the uh, consent calendar? Move approval. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any objection? If not, if not, so ordered. Okay, uh, E, uh, is this Bill? I just have a comment. Yeah. Uh, I'm certainly in, in favor of it. I just want to make a comment that 1996, uh, Mr. Livingston told me the, uh, one, of the, the, one of the parcel taxes on single-family residents, I believe, is $35 a parcel. 1996, no inflation adjustment, that is $57 today. And I would like to suggest that we think it on a future agenda item that we consider putting it to the people uh, as the uh, uh, you know, library district is saying they don't have sufficient revenue. Well, of course, they don't have any inflation adjustment in the uh, parcel tax. And we might want to consider it putting to the people if it's okay and legal and all of that. You know, do you want your library? Will you willing to pay the same burden you did uh, in 2019 that you did in 1996? And put it on the ballot. Just a thought. Okay, very good. Uh, I had one question for the city manager. I noticed that it said the the 23rd amendment to the agreement, but there were two uh, uh, resolutions or in the uh, agenda. The second one is not not an amendment. The one for, one one is for the I guess the tail end of 2018-19, uh, and the other is for next year. So the two items on the agenda, one is the amendment to the agreement and the other is the authorization to the county to collect the tax? Is, okay. Are those the two items you're referring right. to? Okay, so the, what is that, renewing the, uh, is that why it's the 23rd agreement? Cause it, <laughs> yeah, so the, for the approval of the, the 23rd amendment, yes, that's renewing for an additional year and it's the no. year to year, so this is the 23rd amendment. And I'll move approval of E, I just want to make okay. a comment that we think about that as a future. Okay, agenda. is there a, a second to the motion? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, any objection to the uh, motion? If not, so ordered. Can we do that, or do we need a roll call for this one? Oh, uh, this one does not need a roll call. Okay, Consensus good. Is okay. Fine. okay. Matter is cared for. Randy, you had item G. I just wanted to clarify. You know, I, I, I kept reading this, uh, the two ordinances, and I just wanted to be clear. Both of them clearly stipulate that the, um, the three-wheel axle vehicles is only between Hermosa and city limits. So, um, that's just, the county part, right? No, 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 well, Hermosa to Ojai, not yeah. Hermosa to um, the Ojai part. Right. Right. Not so, the that's other the way. only thing that's in here, and, and I was just concerned if, if we were writing something to, um, to affect Creek Road that we're, we haven't done anything other than what's already on the books. And my concern was, I thought the whole idea behind this was to actually petition the county to actually strengthen their ordinance to allow signage and to curtail um, this type of traffic between the city of Ojai and Oakview. I think the issue here is that the ordinance on the county is still on the books, and there used to be a sign, and now it's gone, and we're asking them to at least put the sign up for the existing ordinance, but, and I agree, then do what you're talking about, too. Right, so that, that was the only thing I just wanted to clarify, because I read this, I don't know how many times, and, all, and I kept reading Her Hermosa to the city limits, which is heading east, not heading west, and that was my concern. So um, as long as we're all in agreement as to what we're championing here, yeah. that's fine, and then if we want to take it a step further, maybe that's something that we can add as an, uh, an additional agenda item down the road. Right. Okay, and that's all I had. That was going to be my uh, response to is that this was to make sure that they are um, enforcing what's currently on the books. Okay. But council has recently discussed, you know, taking that further. So that could be something that we bring back. But Absolutely. this was specifically okay. focused on that. Right. Fully in support of that. Perfect. Thank you. Want to make a motion, Randy? Um, Want to move approval? Or? Yeah, move to approve uh, E and. I mean G. G. Second. Okay. G. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any objection to that? If not, so ordered. 
Okay, that takes us uh, to the public hearing. Levy and collection of assessment for lighting and landscaping district number one and number three. Mr. City Manager. And uh, Mr. Grant, our Public Works Director and Engineer is going to um, uh, provide a brief overview on the uh, landscape district, lighting and landscape district. All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I'll make it brief. Uh, this is a routine we go through every year for the lighting districts. Uh, the Council had previously authorized the preparation of the engineer's report back in January. In April, they adopted the engineer's report. Uh, the assessments, as a reminder for these districts, is districts one and three. They're formed separately and they're for street lights and secondarily for maintenance of the improvements of sidewalks, curbs, gutters, and street trees as allowed in the uh, lighting district setup. So uh, I think that's the basic setup. Be glad to answer any questions. Yeah. Mayor, I have a question. Bill. Um, the standard now is LEDs for these street lights. And you're talking about a substantial increase in energy cost, yet if they did the conversion to LED, the cost would go down by about 75 or 80 percent for energy costs. What's going on there with them talking, you know, giving us notice that the energy costs are about to go up? Are they not proceeding with their LED replacements? Or are they going to a different rate structure? And isn't that subject to PUC regulation, what their rate right. rates are? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, there is a, a tariff for the streetlights are primarily owned by SC throughout the city. And uh, there is a LED tariff, which they've allowed for. Uh, we were in line to convert to LED, but we're waiting for Miner's Oaks to go first so we can get, there's still a lot of debate about the color of the light that comes from these LEDs. They keep bringing the color temperature down. So I think they started at 5,000, which is very white, brighter light. And now they're, for instance, at the Y, you see the 5,000 kilo. Uh, Do we have any input into that? Uh, it's, it's our lighting district. Uh, yeah, our, our input was, uh, that we'd like to see these temperatures go down as well as a lot of other cities. 4,000, something like that? Yeah, even even 3,000. Maybe 3,000, okay. 3,000 minus. The HPS that are out there now are close to 3,000. So why would the energy cost be going up if we're doing the LED conversion? Well, there's some debate on that that even SC is getting back to us. Uh, I think in general they're saying they're, Edison is pursuing a rate increase because they're aggressively going after all these improvements to uh, – uh, insulate the system against fire and wind and other issues improve so resiliency. So it's a general across the board thing. It's across the board. But keep in mind on this, the... Uh, that's not energy costs. That's right, right. overall yeah. capital investment rate in the rate structure. Yeah. So these tariffs that we're paying for the lighting, about 30% of that is electric. The majority of that is for the operations and maintenance of the light system. And other cities are also looking at trying to get ownership of the poles back? Yes, a few how, have done how it. How far I've, away is a joint city uh, in th action on that? So I was recently contacted uh, within the last couple of weeks by the city of Oxnard. Uh, I've asked them to give us some information so we can bring it to council. Okay. So they're, but I think they are preparing to make a request to reopen those conversations. Right. So we it, could join it, in with that. Right, but it, it, it is in the early stages. Okay. And, and the issue is complex, uh, the way the... Uh, uh, clean energy program is going, right. the way Edison and the way Edison spreads the cost uh, between residential, uh, commercial, industrial, and in a way, uh, some of this is subsidized uh, under the Edison uh, plan. Some of the communities who bought their own poles right now are getting caught in a much higher oh, okay. uh, rate. So. Uh, in a way, if there's a bright side, no pun intended, uh, to this whole lighting thing, is that right now we're at the low end. We're with Edison's charging everybody else. Those who bought out their poles, I think, are faced with another issue. But anyway, okay. so is there anything else we need to? I have from, a couple questions yeah, from here. Right? Um, uh, you know, Greg, I ask you. I think I ask you this every year. It's it's just redundant for me. Um, first of all, you know, as I walk around my neighborhood, our sidewalks are in horrible shape. Our curbs are in horrible shape. So um, if I had to pay a dollar or two dollars, if I had to pay more to have a to have um, a, a safer sidewalk in my community, I'd be willing to do that. So the first question is, how can we bring this to the voters to increase this forty-one dollars? That'd be my first question. If someone can would like to respond to that, that's great. Um, the second, if um, matter, do you want me to respond to that question first? Yeah. So happy to. So as a increase in the assessments can be brought forward, and the way it's done is it's a uh, protest process, not a put it on the ballot for the whole city to vote, but rather send a notice of proposed increase in the assessment to those who would be assessed. 
that triggers a protest period and folks can submit a written protest and if there is more than half uh, protest file their card saying that they're opposed to the increase then it's dead if less than half protest then it is approved with okay. appropriate notices in a public hearing so the second thing is in um, what I read into this there's 12 actual districts lighting districts mm -hmm. so is that difficult to do um, or or is it or should it just be specific areas that actually specific lighting districts that want to ask or that we want to approach how I know the city the city did uh, establish that district three themselves I mean they prepare the uh, roughly 3,000 envelopes and letters and ballots and uh, put that out and it was just a district wide being really the entire city like you're saying with the various districts and they had across the board but let's uh, say there was a majority of parcel holders in a particular district say we want our sidewalks done and we want to assess ourselves to do that right. could they do that on a district request basis I'll check the city attorney. yeah it can be done and smaller than the whole city okay. and th there it's more of a what do we expect will be approved question so, so maybe the question th then then back to staff is that can you get council um, the specific districts and um, and and where these are in relationship well if you get those to us we'll figure out in the relation relationship to like where I live I'll be able to, to do that and maybe champion my own neighborhood it specifically the second the second thing is I know that um, the, the street repair budget in the CIP I know that you're doing handicap access but there's very limited funding as far as curbs and gutters mm -hmm. and things of that nature so we're uh, as we all recognize that we're just continuing to fall behind mm -hmm. and I can tell you upper drown um, the sidewalks there are in horrible shape right. um, uh, and and I think all of us can can name a couple other streets that way so I'd be interested in figuring that out mm -hmm. the other thing is um, you said that right now in um, there's twenty six thousand um, uh, dollars a surplus and expected a surplus, surplus. Thank you, right, Greg? Mm -hmm. So the question is, do, have you created have you created any type of a um, enhanced maintenance list, and have we assessed the community, and have we looked at how could we could you know how can we spend? I know twenty six thousand dollars isn't going to go very far, mm -hmm. but do we have an assessment of our sidewalks and curbs and gutters um, I know we have an assessment of our streets and then do you have or are you creating some type of a list or a, uh, or a way to go through that and to actually start making some repairs uh, yes we have an assessment we do every year or two of all of the sidewalks we look for trip hazards and we rate the trip hazards and we have those eliminated but it's not uh, I think we reviewed that at one time out in, up in your district and it was uh, that it doesn't necessarily remove and replace a sidewalk it oftentimes is this uh, specialized uh, patent machine that will trim that sidewalk right. cuts it flat so the trip hazards removed and that's a very common approach versus really ripping the slabs and replacing them and then uh, so I guess uh, and we do have our own priority list of certain sidewalks that need replacement and they are expensive and it's kind of a judgment call we might eliminate the trip hazards but uh, it's still in poor condition so we have those in a higher priority Secondly, uh, the ADA consultant we're in the middle of working with right now has gone through and reviewed all the city's sidewalks, uh, curb ramps, buildings, parking lots, and they've got a, they're working with us on a priority list on what is the highest priority, the highest risk to the city, and the and rough expenditure for that. So we're going to have kind of a separate ADA improvement, capital improvement program, and that'll be substantial well beyond anything we're looking at here and then the last question mayor is um, how does our existing tree contract if we're if we're doing street if we're doing tree maintenance in this special district funding or or in the tax of it um, how does that impact the hundred thousand dollars that we have in our other um, tree program if we had significant surpluses here yes we could roll that over because it does include the parkway maintenance okay so if they were trees in the parkway that'd be fine that'd be the way to do that be a usable way but at this point this somewhat minimal surplus wouldn't be uh, substantial enough but uh, for instance if we increase the rates it would okay. and, and mayor I misspoke I, I used the word district I meant zones I assume the answer is the same for zones yeah that's okay. correct all right it's, it's so, so I, zones is how it's structured so again I'd be interested in how we can do that um, we can definitely put together a, an overview of the process and bring right. that back to council because, because I think the community would buy into mm -hmm. it if they saw exactly where the dollar where the dollars were going um, and, and like I said I know I can only speak for where I live and we're in pretty poor shape so 
Thank you, Mark. Okay, with any other comments on this? I would add one thing, that uh, this is a topic that probably should be reviewed also at budget time because there is a cost to the city to conduct those uh, right. mail, uh, what, 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 how do you the, call it? The protest process, yeah. yeah the protest it's process, because there's a lot of areas where that might be applicable. Okay, uh, do I have a motion uh, to? Uh, Before you take a motion, were there any yeah. public comments in the public oh, area? Oh, yeah, I don't have any cards. Any cards for this, uh, for number two? We have no. We uh, we're not. Um, but it, is this for uh, for a sec section two? Okay, because we're going to go to public comment right after I get a get this one off the table. Okay. I'll, I'll move to approve uh, resolutions as outlined in recommendations number two and three. I'll second. Okay. Uh, and what do we? What is? Oh, okay. direct the clerk. Are we just approving all four of those? Uh, we have to do all four. Well, it would be useful if the. Okay, Council so approves the, the last yeah, item as well. I didn't open the public hearing yet, did I? So we, do we need to do, it says conduct a public hearing to receive public testimony. Good comment. The public hearing is now open. Is there anyone in the audience who has no not? No speaker cards, Mayor. Yeah. I know, I need to give everybody another chance. If not, okay, the public hearing is closed. So move approval uh, of items two, three, and four. Uh, one. Well, that we, we just, already, just did one. Yeah, we did, did that one. one. Okay, okay, so uh, we have a motion uh, I'll to. I'll second. And a second. Uh, roll call. Excuse, excuse me. Did Bill? Did Councilman Wyrick say two, three, and four? Yes. Or yes. two and three. Two, three, and four. I corrected myself. Okay. Well, with prompting by the mayor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay uh, roll call. Mayor Johnston. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Francina. Yes. Councilmember Blatz. Yes. Councilmember Haney. Yes. Councilmember Wyrick. Yes. Okay. Uh, Approved. Uh, we will now go to our public comment period. And does the clerk have any cards, or, or did you need? Did we have? Uh, I think we also have the plaza maintenance districts. Yeah, right. We're we'll, at the right. right. We'll get. We'll we're get at, right back to it as quickly as we can. Didn't forget. Okay. Slaves to the clock. Please don't leave the room. Yeah. Don't go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't leave. I, I am honoring <laughs> Susan's desire that we do this. <laughs> no, 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 no. My desire is that we do it without <laughs> interruption. Oh, I see. We do public comment in uh, the natural order. Okay, well, <laughs> okay, well, I get in the unnatural order. We've got. Uh, but it's close. Uh, Catherine Barron. Uh, is it? Is it Barron? Catherine? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What is the natural order? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Catherine Barron. I have come to express my hope that our city council take critical leadership action during this ecological crisis by declaring a climate emergency. Cities and local governments have historically been the spark for widespread progress, as local advancement inspires mobilization across the board. A declaration of climate emergency is a resolution that puts the local government on record in support of emergency action to reverse climate crisis and ecological destruction. It is imperative to recognize the massive amount of internationally accepted research collected and agreed upon by the UN, IPCC, and Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, finding that fossil fuels are actively harming our communities and causing immediate peril to health and safety now by urgently threatening our ability to inhabit this planet. We must use policy to direct the transition to renewable sources of energy and food that will provide a greater number of jobs where workers are not exposed to dangerous conditions with carcinogenic petrochemicals. Across the world, over 600 local na and national governments representing over 77,700,000 people, including 14 cities and counties in California, have already taken the first step to regenerating their communities by declaring support for emergency action to prevent further climate disruption. Resolutions take many forms, and I'm happy to provide this council with references to a variety of examples and templates. I would also request that the council take comprehensive measures to include the voices of the underrepresented, those who are already struggling with socioeconomic deprivation or racial injustice. The well-being of these community members are most vulnerable at this time, so perhaps an inclusive citizens' assembly could meet with Council to formulate an environmentally and socially fair resolution. 
I ask that my representatives represent me, represent the youth, and represent the sanctity of life and future generations and create a solid foundation for resilience by declaring a climate emergency in this city and taking the lead to transition away from fossil fuels. Thank you for hearing me. I will do my best to not let this matter slip from the list of priorities. This is our chance to fight for the well-being of our ecosystem, our community, and our lives. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Wait, hang well, on. Can I say something? You may. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for speaking out. It's impo so important. Can you mail what you email that so that we can follow up? Yes. And are you speaking independently, or are you part of an uh, of a organization or connected with other groups that are working toward this? I am part of um, Extinction Rebellion Ojai, but I am speaking independently this evening. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm glad to know that. Thank yes. you. Nice job. Thank you, yeah. uh, Moss Vidal. Hi again, I was here, I, I think it was about a month ago. I am the one representing the Drown, Slow Down Drown initiative. And um, I recently met with a gentleman named Paul Crabtree who works under Greg Grant to, to provide a report for him. Uh, Greg wanted a report. Um, I spent a good amount of time with him and uh, Dave Silva, who's also a neighbor on our street. And he, um, he said the evidence based on his research is overwhelming, that there's an obvious issue of speeding on the street, and not to mention all of the other issues that we've been discussing that make Drown a very unique street with a unique problem. Um, I have to say that uh, just recently I went to a neighbor's house who was selling her house and I, and I mentioned to her, you know, I don't think we have you on our initiative. And uh, she said, what is it? And I explained to her what it was. She said, you know, funny thing is 25 years ago when we moved here, we also tried to do that. And I said, wow, what a surprise. This has been going on at least 25 years. It's been an issue. A week later, I ran, in, I ran into a gentleman at, at a park, and he said, you know, 10 years ago when I lived on Drown, I also tried to get people together to slow people down on that street because there was a problem. He decided to move. So this is an ongoing problem. We have more signature. Our petition is close to, uh, I think, in the 90 percentile. We're missing only two homes and one individual that is not in support of it. Um, you know, I, we're not asking for a freeway exit. We're just asking to install these speed pads. I, I, I realize there's a new term for this. These aren't humps. There are pads. These are pads. And these pads allow for enough space so that a fire truck does not have to slow down. And because their axis, their wheel um, axle is wide enough that they can, that's part of their design. And they work, they work, they're working in other cities. Um, I know um, William Werrick, Werrick asked for what about an initiative that uh, I either fund it or the street is willing to support this. Can we, can we put this on the agenda? That's what I'd like to do next. Okay. We, we've got support. I'll keep sending people here. We will keep coming. They work. Everything else is a Band-Aid. You know, um, I know we've done some speed control there. It's helping, but unless it's a permanent fixture, it happens at night, it happens at four in the morning, it happens at 10 in the morning. It's a constant issue. And I think safety should be a priority for all of us. I mean, we're just trying to slow people down. We're not asking them to stop. We're just asking them to slow down. They look good. And, um, and we just need your support. And I think that we're willing to, to create a fund. I'm willing to just make it happen. And I think that what you'll notice is that they will work on other problem streets that we recognize exist in this city. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, that's all I wanted to say. And I'm hoping, can we add this to the agenda for next, uh, the next meeting? Is that possible? I mean, what, what's, what's stopping us? 
Well, you've, you've raised the point. The city manager has the request, and we will uh, talk about when that should come up. Okay. But, uh, we won't wait 20 years. We'll yeah. yeah. And we can Thank also you. maybe put it in the CIP budget. Right, yeah. If funding comes in, then it's already in our, our, uh, our capital program. Okay. Yeah, on the, what is it, 20, 25th? Uh, the 25th city council meeting, you might want to be here because there's going to be a, uh, the last of the workshops for the budget and just okay. put in a pitch for this important. Uh, That'll include the capital improvement budgets. Right. right. Okay. okay. So, so, so would there be a partial funding city, partial, uh, you know, homeowners, uh, or would it be? We would have to vote on that. I would suggest that you and your neighbors would Show be welcome up. to come down and uh, and make the case again for okay. uh, for that issue. But then it'll be the uh, the issue of finance and the engineering and all that. And, you know, may take a little bit of time, but we can get an answer for you. Okay. How, can I get a response? How are you all feeling about it? I mean, does it feel like something? Yeah. <laughs> the council, under the Brown Act, the council can't make a decision on something that's not on their agenda. Got it. So okay. we can't have a straw poll. Of, I realize it's not an efficient <laughs> process. The Brown Act's not meant for efficiency. You can do But it, it will return. <laughs> um, I, I'll look to see managers to when it will return. But there will be an opportunity, I think, with the budget next time for the council to make that choice. But it's not on their agenda tonight, so they can't give you a... Got it. Got it. But they okay. more, more importantly, we, we have asked for it to be agendized Good. so it's yeah. just a matter of the city manager putting it on the on right. an agenda yeah. and also um, understanding the CIP process that that could take longer than the community of drown wants to wait so you might come back and with a proposal um, of some joint venture you yeah. purchasing we installing but um, think outside of the box on all yeah. that okay Okay. For those of you who don't know CIP, Capital Improvements Program, right. But, Thank you, Mouse. But I, well, I have a comment. Um, just because he's been back so many times, it is my understanding that this will be on the agenda. Do you have, do you know when? Okay. Yes. So it was. We can, we can ask okay. that. The later. agenda, there is a protocol for setting the agenda. This gentleman has made a very good case for putting this on an agenda. Now is not the time to make that decision as to when. We've got a full agenda that's coming up to, uh, for the budget. But during the workshop, there will be an opportunity to speak again, and then we will, then we'll schedule it. Okay. okay, I thought it was already scheduled, but okay. And then I just want to make sure you got my email. I did get your email. Thank right. you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yes, I saw. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, David Silva. <laughs> ah, the mysterious member of the girls <laughs> softball team. <laughs> I was insisting on hijacked making on you a part of that. Yeah, I got hijacked. I'm, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. Like I'm going to be in a photo. <laughs> Don't be. I wasn't on the team either. <laughs> Hey, yes, I just want to, um, uh, my name's David Silva. I was here with my wife, Elizabeth. We live on Drown. We were here a lot in the last meeting. I just want to um, solicit your support to help us work through the process and uh, try to figure out what we need to do to do some traffic calming measures um, that'll just create a safer environment for all of us who um, have kids or walk our dogs, play in the street, et cetera, on Drown. It, you know, it is a problem. We did meet with the gentleman that probably about an hour last Sunday was it last Paul Sunday Crabtree. yeah mm -hmm. Civil Engineer. Yeah, yeah we know Paul yeah. And yeah, we he, work with Paul he had some really interesting he's great. He's insights great. Um, he's worked on a lot of projects um, and uh, had us thinking a little bit out of the box in terms of like you know maybe this is a first step but there could be other things to look at so it's yeah. really really helpful resource so thank you for sending him out him to us and um, I really don't have much more to say um, other than that I actually work for an ESCO which is an energy services company um, globally and uh, we just put LED lights uh, in the city of Phoenix like we retrofitted the whole city oh really so if someone needs to get resources or information um, you can help consider me a resource okay. for that thank so, you David appreciate welcome. it thank you so the much. public works guy right 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 back there <laughs> also also uh, <laughs> um, mayor we should just clarify uh, that Paul Crabtree is a contract employee of the city he does not work for the city and he does not report to Greg Grant well, yes and no. He does not report. Yeah, he's, he not a, a, he's not a city employee. That's right. Who, you know, right. Who, but that nonetheless, he has been about a commissioner and other things in his right. well thought of. Right. He's part of the Complete Streets Committee. He's a consultant. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Bill Miley. Um, good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Bill Miley, and... This time I've lived here for 51 years, my family. <laughs> Little feedback about the 
new stop signs at the corner of Signal, North Signal Street and Summer. Uh, I live on North Signal above Grand, so I experience it a lot. It's going great. It's just fitted right in. It seemed like it was always needing to stop at that point. Um, so I think it was a great decision. It was a great installation. There's two new stop signs. There's warning to let you know, and also there are nice crosswalks. So great improvement. Um, I want to speak of the, tonight I want to speak about the income sources that the city has. So for many years, it was many years ago, I realized that the city government has provided the money it gets comes from a whole bunch of different sources, property taxes, bed taxes called transit occupancy taxes, fees for services, federal sources for highway funds, fuel taxes, state sources, and specifically for the point I want to make tonight, state sales tax. So most retail sales within our city include a state sales tax of 7.5%. Years ago, the state legislature agreed to do this. They got the, elect the governor to agree to it, and they raised it to 7.25%. That's the basic sales tax throughout California. In fact, the whole sales tax thing started nine months after I was born. In August of 1933. That's no coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> during, during Prohibition. And it's still going, right? <laughs> they charged 2.5% at that time. In 1996, statewide voters approved a state law requiring any planned local sales tax increase to be approved by the local voters. Okay? So of the 7.5% today, state law says 1% goes back to the cities. 1%. And one quarter percent goes to transportation purposes to the counties. So, one percent of seven and a quarter percent is what our city gets on each retail dollar spent here in the city. There are some exclusions like groceries and, and other things, okay? So cities with the support of voters can add additional percentages which the state will return fully to them. And they're called supplemental local taxes. Our city has never done that. So I believe it's time to consider supplementing our city government's funding sources by asking our voters to approve a slight increase in sales tax, something like a half percent. It would generate funds to help meet needs and solve problems the current budget can't handle. For those of you that watched the city council budget session last Wednesday, there were lots of needs and programs that probably aren't going to be met because the city council members don't expect to have the money for them next year. So let's look at the neighboring cities. Again, what are Bill, they doing with supplemental Bill, you're uh, starting to exceed your time, so uh, I'll give okay. you a uh, can wind it up, but I'll uh, give I'm you a little bit more. Up. Ventura, seven and three quarters. Oxnard, Oxnard, seven and three quarters. Port Wyneme, eight and three quarters. Carpinteria, nine. Santa Barbara, eight and three quarters, and a lot of us, a lot of the other cities have seven and a quarter like that. So I believe it's prudent and timely for this council, sometime soon, to publicly discuss adding a small supplemental sales tax for our city's future. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay, I do not have any more cards. Does the clerk have any more? None? Okay, well, the public comment period has now come to a close, and Mr. Grant, uh, we didn't forget you. <laughs> We're trying to get you out of here early. Uh, we have a levy for an assessment for the Arcade Plaza Maintenance District. Uh, Mr. City Manager, do you have any introduction? No, uh, Mr. Grant will do the overview for this. <clears throat> okay, good evening again, council, uh, Councilman. Uh, I was, it, it's a reminder, it is a public hearing as well, whether you can, mm -hmm. after the uh, <laughs> Thank you. intro here, I think we can mention <laughs> that, that, so <laughs> make sure we catch that. It was a good catch last time, appreciate that. And uh, so this is the Arcade Plaza Maintenance District. Uh, as a reminder, this provides funding for utility and maintenance costs associated with the Arcade Plaza. So if people aren't familiar with that, that's the downtown arcade frontage and the uh, plaza behind it. And so it's roughly, roughly encompassed by uh, Matillaha, Ojai Avenue, signal to uh, Montgomery Street. And it also includes part of the uh, south side of the street as well from uh, 
from the Nomad Gallery over to the new brewery. And uh, so this uh, primary renovation that was done in that plaza was in 2002. Uh, the plaza had a $2.5 million renovation, and that was at the time that the uh, redevelopment agency was available in for the funding. And uh, that's been in increasingly deteriorating. We've been doing a lot of maintenance on that and bringing it back up to par. But uh, the good news is, is about a few years ago, we had five years of increases, 5% per year. So it brought up 25% over a five-year period. The, uh, exactly the process that Councilman Handy was talking about is uh, we reached out to anybody in this district and everybody voted to support an increase to, if they were going to see benefits from right. it. I think most people are happy with that, what we've been doing and are continuing with. So, uh, Does that include any of the parking lots or is it just the plaza itself? Uh, it really ca can include as part of the district. It, previously, we were so far in it, an accumulated deficit that we didn't part, we, we did a slurry with our own crews and we brought that up to par. But that's a split, the plaza parking lot south of Matillaha that would be included? Even, uh, even, even the one to the north. The, okay. I'll have to check the exact boundary, but at least half of that uh, okay. farmer's market. So yeah, there is three parking lots there, the uh, one out in front of the Rainbow Bridge, the one in the middle, and then the one right. farmer's market as well. So that was all increased, and at this point we're just knocking out the, uh, the accumulated deficit. So that's uh, nearly completed. Uh, the estimates are that we'll be down to zero accumulated deficit next year. And because uh, we do have approximately $55,000 uh, surplus for this particular year proposed coming up. and. Uh, we do have some substantial improvements, such as the, the frontage of the arcade. We're planning to paint, paint that this fall. You also this can't see the stripes in the parking lot anymore. And <laughs> we, we actually do have, under the CIP, proposed to do new slurry with striping. But I think there's an interesting point be, being brought up here. You know, we might be able to do something minimal, wait for a couple of years, and put it into the plaza assessment district. Or and that would save the CIP like 26000 Or wait for your new equipment. Right. <laughs> Uh, so painting the arcade and also looking at a landscape contractor to uh, start stepping up the uh, level of maintenance for the landscaping in the uh, plaza area as well. There you so, go. Okay. So we're going to get on that. That's interesting. Yes. So there, are there any questions? Have, are are you done? Question. I'm, I'm yeah, done. Are there any I'm questions quick. for Greg before I open real, the public hearing? Yeah, real quick, the uh, rents for the outside dining areas, that goes into this fund? No, it doesn't. Right now it goes into the general fund. In the general fund. Mm-hmm. So that's something that would be we could talk about. And there's a clarification to be made there, if you'll allow me, Mr. Mayor. The outdoor dining areas that is on city-owned property do not pay rent. At the moment, they pay an annual permitting fee that covers the city's permitting costs, which the amount I think the city man the public works director has available. There's not an additional rent charged on top. It's within the city's power to charge rent, and under Prop 26, rent can be structured at any rate the market will bear. But that hasn't isn't presently in the uh, my understanding is we're cards. charging about four dollars a foot for the permitting fee uh, I will ask I, I think the initial 150 square foot is four the next 150 square foot is two after that it becomes one dollar square foot so they did it a little quick and dirty four dollars a foot a year is 33 cents a foot a month mm -hmm. Boy, that's the best deal anywhere in this market I, I guess that gets back to what the dining. attorney's saying is that it's not rent it was really meant to be no, I, I understand but, uh, yeah we have but, that option right and certainly as is evident the council has the power to impose a, a true rent charge if so that's desired. something we could talk about on the future agenda mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a, cl a clarification. it could go in this fund okay Randy. Right. so um, Greg on uh, on page three or two it uh, you talk about the approximately 27 percent of the district's assessment revenues come from the city's general plan um, and then underneath it you have an additional 17,000 in general benefits services is paid by the city's general plan so is that seventeen thousand dollars a part of the twenty-seven percent, or is that seventeen thousand general benefit service in addition to the twenty-seven percent? Uh, there's seventeen thousand dollars in assessments for city-owned property that we pay assessments on, and then uh, for the general benefit things like the restroom, the city is uh, which, which is not exclusively utilized by the uh, assessment district property owners. We have a share which is considered that general benefit, and we that was around sixty-three hundred dollars. Well, as I was saying, you say here on here, you um, you kind of broke it out, broke it out, saying thirty-three thousand is assessed by city-owned property, and the remaining one hundred and forty-five thousand is assessed to the private individual. So, I get that. I just didn't understand what the general benefit service seventeen thousand dollars. I don't. I, I just don't know what that is. Right, and so that uh, really is primarily to share in areas that. 
were not exclusively utilized by the, uh, the property owners there. So it was restroom, and I think there was a couple other areas. There's some general benefit of the parking lots as well that are not exclusively uh, utilized in, by, the, by, by the people in that district. So it was uh, the way that Prop 218 is written up, you're supposed to share, the city would share directly, not as an assessment. But okay, so I'm pay. just saying that we're, we're paying an additional 17000 to cover those spaces. Okay, so um, I don't know if I'm for that or against it, but mm -hmm. I just needed to understand that. And then we still have a contract with uh, Harrison Sun, and they're doing our restroom and are doing our trash removal too, correct? Our trash can removal? Uh, they do trash removal, and then we have a separate contract for uh, custodial and the restroom. So, uh, so again, as far as a general benefit service, we're, we're giving that also along in that space. Am I correct, or is that, or is that being paid out of this fund? Uh, it's being paid out of this fund. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Susan? Okay. Can you use uh, some of this money, if necessary, for bike parking and pedestrian benches? Yes. Okay, so uh, how, do, how do we uh, get that rolling? Uh, I guess uh, <laughs> I was at Java nice and Joe, there was no bike parking in front. Number one rule, as close as the nearest car parking spot not hidden somewhere mm -hmm. and there were three or four bikes and we were all talking there's still no bike okay parking. well you've identified a potential source of uh, yeah. money to do this and at a later agendized meeting <laughs> we should give direction right yeah, i'm right. sorry was that <laughs> you saying the arcade areas we'd like to see them or more in the back no in the job java and joe right in we're, front we're tired of using put, the, 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 tra where, the the traffic where, sign posts and the stairwell yeah, i always thought that were good i always did wherever that, you okay. see a bike right. park to a pole or a bench <laughs> yeah. or a newspaper rack that's where you so need maybe a couple on matillaha the good old days we're still we've got some more by the <laughs> farmer's for market lot yeah okay so we'll uh we'll, we'll take a look at that. maybe a couple in the arcade and a couple on matilla especially in front of java joe Okay. Especially, yeah. All right, that'll be easy one. Any coffee shop, yeah. that's where the yeah. bikes are. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Greg. Thank you. Okay, Thank we you. will now uh, open the public hearing. Uh, do we have any cards? Uh, I have no cards. I don't see anybody dashing forward, so we will I have a, close you know, the public I'm hearing. I'm wondering if Ron Serino is, thinks that we still haven't had unscheduled items. Sitting there. Oh, why don't I finish this one item and then we'll okay. yeah, then we'll take that up. Okay, okay. Move, so move approval, Mayor. Oh. Okay, I've got a motion to approve. One, two, and three. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Uh, call the roll, please. Mayor Pro Tem Francina. Yes. Councilmember Haney. Yes. Councilmember Wyrick. Yes. Councilmember Blatz. Yes. Mayor Johnston. Yes. Okay. Your question was what? I'm wondering if, if Ron Serena. So I mean, who, who is the that? library? Oh, you mean <laughs> that he may be thinking? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Ron, is, oh, you're oh, you're your watch. Just keep an eye on us. That's good. Okay. Yeah. He speaks up in public sorry, comment sorry. when he wants to. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. And our, 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 yeah. So Rosano, <laughs> <laughs> I, my emphasis is I'm sorry, Ron. I always yeah. go back to my high here? school buddy <laughs> that had a different uh, came from a different part of Spain. Uh, okay. So we've got number two, number three done. We're now to discussion items number four. Introduction of an ordinance prohibiting smoking at multifamily residential complexes. Mr. City Manager. Thank you. This item is on the agenda. It was um, directed on May 14th, 2019. Uh, that uh, council directed that we prepare an ordinance prohibiting smoking smoking in multi-unit residences. <coughs> we have prepared the ordinance the, and that is what is on the agenda. The, um, currently, the city code includes a prohibition of smoking in all public places within the city. However, that's been interpreted to apply only to the interior of buildings and facilities, and it previously did not include multi-unit residences. The ordinance before you clearly states that pr smoking is prohibited in multi-unit residences inc and includes private balconies, porches, decks, patios, and common areas. <coughs> the ordinance does allow for the option for smoking for uh, units if there is a separate ventilation system that's been approved by the building official and um, Notably the ordinance also requires landlords to post no smoking signs to provide written notice to tenants regarding the prohibition and to require landlords to provide warnings to offending tenants One item we wanted to clarify uh, quickly um, the ordinance also adds an additional location where smoking is prohibited that wasn't previously included in the city code. 
it adds the arcade and plaza areas, which you'll find on page five of attachment A. That's in response to the city receiving multiple complaints of that, but that is a uh, decision that council can choose to adopt or remove from the ordinance. Um, at this point, the ordinance is provided and uh, we are looking for council direction on whether to move forward with the adoption. Okay. Uh, I don't have any, do I have any cards on this? No. None? Okay. I see an interested party out there though. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so. Um, I would just Bill. like to say I want to uh, really appreciate, uh, call out the Mr. Uh, the City Attorney, Mr. Summers. I had a couple of concerns on just clarifying language and he responded to them very efficiently and, and uh, that satisfied all my concerns. So. Thank you. And I'm happy to review those briefly if the council would like. Those were the changes that were proposed in the revised ordinance that was put out on the day as today, and I think copies are available in the lobby for the public, or that can be done if needed. Um, the changes were briefly, for smoking, we adjusted the definition to not just pick up carrying a mechanical device, but to rather to pick up carrying or burning or exhaling a lighted or a lit cigarette or e-cigarette or activated e-cigarette uh, used for consuming tobacco or any other weeds or plants. Second. We added group homes to the list of prohibited places. Previously included were uh, private homes run as daycare centers or um, similar but not, um, or childcare facilities, but not group homes. So we added that in. Um, we also added in an express requirement that the building official approve a separate ventilation system in any location. That was always the intent. The language could have been, uh, was improved. And lastly, the language regarding the prohibition in multi-unit residences was clarified to make clear that the exceptions, of course, are those separate ventilation areas by cross-referencing to the revised uh, provision allowing for that. Again, as approved by the building official. And that was it in terms of the substantive changes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh. Susan. Do, do you need to hear from us how we feel about adding the arcade plaza and the arcade because I would be in favor. That is one of the policy choices before the council. Um, I understand there, there may, that support, there may be some opposition as well. Yeah, well, you, you can include that in a motion to approve as submitted and then it can be amended uh, right. to Correct. change okay. whatever it's sections it, of the it, code. It's, it's in this, uh, it's in there. Oh, it's, it's, it's in there. Yeah, okay. it's in sorry, the handout sorry. right here. Yeah, it's, it's in the current ordinance no, on speak. page, <laughs> yeah. uh, where'd it go? Okay. Five. Thank you. So I'll, I'll make a comment since it may be appropriate at this time. Um, first of all, I want to thank ATN Emanuel who, for bringing this to our attention and really bringing it forward. Um, but I also want to say that the intent of what we were looking at was to worry about multifamily homes and specifically a situation that I think wasn't appropriate that Mr. Uh, Emanuel and his uh, pregnant wife, and by the way, they've had their baby and doing very well. Congratulations, well, congratulations ATN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Known ATN a long time. Um, Arthur. That, they, uh, that that was what was going on. But to suddenly try and restrict smoking from the arcade area is a massive change in this community that I don't know if everybody understands. Outside the hub, outside the vine, outside of many of the restaurants in the arcade, it has been going on for as long as the, you've been forced to smoke outside. I personally don't smoke. But I think it would be a massive change. We haven't had really a situation. As this was not the intent of this. The intent of this was to deal with multi-use homes. Uh, we've not had anyone come up and complain about the situation at the arcade. And frankly, with those businesses and the way they operate, um, there's no reason to punish them or the people that would go there for doing it the way they've done it, where it seems like it's been done correctly. So I would not be in approval and I don't really know why it was added because I don't think we really discussed it, frankly, uh, the arcade plaza area as being a restricted smoking area. Does the current uh, law uh, prohibit smoking within a certain distance of uh, entries and exits? Because I have had complaints. I go to the wine mm -hmm. fairly regularly <laughs> uh, it's been trivia night and when you open the front and the back door, <laughs> it's a chimney <laughs> through there. Uh, but that could be dealt with not by prohibiting totally, but... To right, that could be added as a prohibition. Right now we don't have a prohibition on smoking within X amount uh, outside but within X feet of a door or a window. A lot of ordinances do that so that it That's stays away the, and then it doesn't drift inside and then everything's fine. Is that a... 
Is that you can structure it that way. What you're well, I, I just feel like the business owners know their clientele. If there's a problem, they're going to restrict it. They're absolutely allowed to do that. The business owner can say, you have to be 10 feet away from our entrance. Um, and I would, I would much rather not be policing and having over authoritative government where the business owners can handle what their problems are, determine what their clients want. And uh, by all means, if, if the people inside don't like it, they're either going to stop patronizing there and they'll change their policy or they can, they don't, they don't have to voluntarily go there. But for those types of businesses and those types of places, uh, there's a little bit different expectation on what you're going to experience there. And it's part of uh, what they generally, um, it's the way I feel, they, that's how they've conducted their business. And I don't think we should be, I, I only think it would be punishing those businesses in some way by enforcing this in a, in a manner that was not what we intended it to be. At least not what I ever expected this ordinance to be. Okay, well, let, can, can I say something? Sure. Okay. Well, let, let's discuss this a little bit more because Smoking is prohibited in Libby Park, correct? In Sarzodi Park? Yeah, all the hey, city's parks is prohibited. Are there, can you uh, refresh us? What other locations are smoking prohibited? If there's any other areas in the city? Generally, it is any open, it's, it's any public space that's enclosed. So any any uh, restaurant or bank or store or facility, <clears throat> anything owned by the city, anything owned by the school district, anything going by the county um, but all of this is inside and then the parks are on top is a further prohibition for exterior spaces um, but it doesn't it doesn't pick up things like in the issue arose uh, in addition to some of the complaints is arisen where with respect to smoking in the back of the arcade not the front but the and the plaza area whether that is or is not prohibited um, so if that has been, in the current ordinance has been interpreted to say that that's not prohibited because it all doesn't pick up exterior spaces. It picks up interior spaces, and that's exterior. Hence, the uh, the proposal to change it, of course, is subject to the council's desire. I mean, do we? Wait, wait, I'm not done. Okay. Um, so, in other words, if you're, if, and I've experienced this, you're dining outside, for example, at um, Agava Maria, I think it's called now, in front of the art center and someone uh, steps right outside the wall there and starts smoking, and obviously it's drifting to where you're eating. So then, as a customer, it, it falls on my shoulders to walk over and ask the gentleman or whoever it is to please move a little bit further down. And there might be outdoor dining. If so, so pe in other words, without this, people that can smoke right outside outdoor dining, is that correct? That is currently allowed, yes. Right, but, but to make it clear, if you go to the restaurant owner and you tell the restaurant owner, the restaurant owner can absolutely say, you need to move away from my facility in order to smoke. The restaurant owner does have that choice. The, the, re, the distinction is that the restaurant owner has that choice. An individual can't call the sheriffs and have the sheriffs enforce. I understand. It, it, I, it's awkward all around. <laughs> right, it's but just, how many calls do you get for enforcement of the smoking? Of, uh, well, it's not illegal right now, so. Yeah, I... I I don't know offhand how many we receive, right? Yeah, but I suspect but, not a lot. But probably not a lot because I think I think at the end of the day, I think people realize that although they may interpret it as being rude to smoke in an outdoor seating area because people want to enjoy the outdoors and not have to smell somebody else's smoke, I get that. Um, they have not reached to calling us, and I think that even if you have an ordinance along these lines, we could take the same stance where really what we're asking for is compliance. We're not going to go out and start right. citing everybody that's smoking cigarettes. You know, yeah. obviously there's, you know, we would ask, and I think to Susan's point, if you're asking the business owner or the other customers to make the initiative to ask somebody to, that may not get the positive response they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, many jurisdictions have found it beneficial to have some sort of radius around doors, uh, and that then the proprietor has said, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to step down uh, a bit here because they do, there's a city ordinance which yeah. gives them the same thing like in, the, in housing. If, if the uh, land or we call it the property manager has something they can point to and say, look, pal, I, you know, I, it doesn't bother me, but it is the law and it does bother other people, so we ask you. It, the enforcement is mostly a, a, by social pressure and 
the expectation has been stated right and the expectation in this case would be stated by the city rather than the business owner so they're not having to take on the responsibility yeah. of saying yeah. i don't want you to smoke here we still want your business though right in this case and something that i more or less whispered to matt, matt was it doesn't have to be necessarily all inclusive right you could say no smoking in the arcade during this time so that you call out all the businesses that are open during the day and then maybe the businesses that do have smoking that occur outside such as the vine and the hub where it's allowed permissible let's say from 8 p.m until they close then maybe you're drawing a, a balance between what the because if you if i if i'm the hub and i say i don't want you smoking in front of my business because the people in here don't like it once you step down there well that's somebody else's business now they have to shuffle them down the, the yeah. road right and so we're trying to not have that undue burden and just throwing it out there right i'm yeah no it's a good idea my opinion of ways to help navigate this and and appeal to the people who like to sit outside and eat without having to smell cigarette smoke myself being included yeah. Yeah, i have a question of matt if i may Pardon? matt is it true that beverly hills bans smoking outright that is my uh, uh, recollection I haven't confirmed it recently but I do understand and there's certainly uh, a number of cities that have done that I'm familiar with Calabasas smoking ordinance and they've banned it everywhere except inside of private single-family residences okay, so and inside private cars did, did North Korea ban it everywhere uh, anyway the, <laughs> well this is um, something to consider because I, 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 but in practicality we're actually if we put a distance on in front of the hub are we asking people to stand in the street I mean are we literally gonna no, put people in the that, street they, yeah. they go five they go five businesses down well if, if it was if, if one was following what the chief so was it's only if it's an open business that that would be the rule or at a timeline I mean, what what amendment are we actually talking about here to make this work because in practicality we're fixing a problem that nobody said was really a problem and if you want to make it after well, dinner yeah. I mean it is a problem real, which restaurant in the arcade are you <coughs> talking about where you've experienced this no, I, well, I, I don't eat out that much, but I have experienced it at the Mexican rest, Agave Maria. Well, this, and the other, I mean, this, nobody smokes the, the at the vegan, ordinance, the at the the ordinance vegan would, cafe. Right, but the arcade <laughs> ordinance wouldn't have anything to do with Agave Maria anyway. So we're not, yeah, no, well, we're we're ta not talking about Okay, this. guys, uh, I think we've, we've chatted enough to decide that are we going to have a motion, and then we can then work the, work the motion over uh, so that we know what we're either agreeing to or not agreeing to. So do we have a motion? But can I ask a question so I can? Certainly. I need help. Okay. You may. Go this ahead. is our, our chance. I mean, I realize that this started uh, because of issues at multifamily residential complexes, but is there a way to add some wording? Um, or do we have to go back to the drawing board and do another ordinance? Uh, some wording that would make it so that people, can, you know, there is a buffer zone when, for outdoor dining for. You know, yeah, that could be revised. You could add, instead of the prohibition on um, the arcade plaza as defined, you could say within 50 feet of any outdoor dining area. And if you wanted to add the time component, you could say within 50 feet of any outdoor dining area while in operation. I'm, I'm going to ask this. If we're going to consider this, I think it's appropriate because this was packed into, this is our third reading of this. This was added at the last one. This was not what anybody's been talking about or what the intent of where we started was. Nobody asked for this in any of our, con I, I did not hear anybody directly requesting this to be added to the ordinance at any point. And we have absolutely no, none of the arcade vendors and owners who would be here who would actually be impacted by this. Okay, we're not they, getting any input from them. But there's a waiting period, is there not? Uh, if, if something were to be introduced, if, then they, there would be an opportunity for people to Right, come. it would come back next yeah. time for, for um, yeah, second meeting our, and adoption. During our budget meeting and, well. But it's, you want to make a, a it's at the council's pleasure. You could also okay. strike that provision and take that up at a later date. Okay, okay. Well, Mayor. Mayor, just yeah, a question. Randy. Just, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but how did it get in here? How did it, who called? Did two council people ask for that writing to be a part of this? Who inserted this into this? Discussion? I added it based on minor conversations with the sheriff's administrative sergeant based on the, the citations that had been put in place based on individual complaints and the fact that we couldn't we couldn't prosecute those citations because we did not have an actual prohibition on smoking in the arcade plaza. Okay. And I'm going to ask a question. What what is their what is what is their uh, authority as far as making policy for the city of Ojai? Like any of us they can make a recommendation to the council. None none of us Was can. it recommended to the council before? Okay, let the, we, we <laughs> this is a cross examination let's get, let's get a on something. And, uh, on. Let's let's, let's, let's uh, bring it back. Okay. Yeah. You have a motion. There are a lot of places that think this you know, we look for a model ordinance. We didn't 
get as thorough as this. It evolved up. It is now here. We can take it off. We can amend it out. We had a lot of choices, it, but it is a, a point. And I have had people approach me, uh, particularly when I'm at the, uh, at the Vine uh, in, the, in the back area, and some of the people who are vaping are my neighbors. So uh, I know it, it is awkward, but I, it seems to me if we were to have just simply a buffer zone uh, from places where people are eating uh, and uh, doorways uh, after a certain hour maybe. I, you know, I, I think that, I, I agree with you, you don't want to say somebody move down the way and blow the smoke into their bills, you know, business. Uh, that's how this all got started back in the days when we first had prohibition against smoking. How many of you were in uh, restaurants where the no smoking section was just next in the table next to where you were sitting and the person <laughs> smoking was holding it away so the smoke wasn't in their face? Um, well, I would urge a motion to get this going where okay. if we target what the need was. We okay. can always amend in the future. Okay. On, on and I want to make it clear. I'm not against at all restriction yeah. against okay. outdoor seating areas, but that is included. Restaurants, including okay. outdoor okay. seating areas, are okay. specific specifically included in the ordinance already. Okay, well, we We're make not, a motion that- That's all of them, not just in the arcade. That's everywhere. And where you're talking about it is not allowed. And how far outside their building they want to do it, it seems to me like that wouldn't be a criminal activity. Okay. Okay. That would be a so, business okay, Well, we don't even have a motion policy. yet, but if you'd like to make a motion and exclude the stuff that it, you know, it seems impractical or onerous. Well, I, Mr. Weirich, are all of your concerns in here? Because it was a little yes. confusing to me. Were they all dealt with? Okay. Yeah. So you did check that. Then I would, I would say with the- uh, I would make a motion to, to approve this with the modifications that have been made with the updated ordinance, not the one in the packet, minus number 23. Now second that motion. Okay, yeah. Okay. I'm fine with that. Okay. okay. And bring it back to amend, yeah, Good motion. so that okay. we can move forward, yeah. yeah. Okay, is there any further discussion then? Uh, we have a motion and a second. Okay, uh, call the roll. Council Member Wyrick. Yes. Council Member Haney. Yes. Council Member Blatz? Yes. Council Member Francina? Yes. Mayor Johnston? Yes. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks, ATN. Yeah. yeah. Back and improve it. Okay. Yeah. We can take care of him first. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We are now on discussion item exactly. number uh, five. Okay. I see some familiar faces in the audience, a topic that is of interest to them. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Mr. City Manager, would you like to introduce? I have a couple of cards or a sure. public comment when we're ready. Yes, thank you. Uh, so on uh, at the last council meeting on May 28th, 2019, council voted to adopt an ordinance permitting and regulating cannabis manufacturing and micro business facilities within the city. We also discussed potential taxes and fees um, and considered a proposed business license tax of up to 10% on gross receipts of cannabis businesses with an initial rate to be set by council <coughs> at 4%. Um, council stated a preference for general tax, and so what we have done is now uh, before you, you have the um, resolutions uh, submitting that general um, business tax, uh, cannabis business tax to the voters and setting a application and renewal fee. Um, briefly, the uh, we performed some analysis looking at staff uh, real staff costs over the last year uh, real time spent on processing applications interviewing applicants and issuing licenses and renewals and overseeing those we proposed uh, fees listed here uh, the application fee of five thousand two hundred seventy eight dollars an interview fee of nine hundred and eighty four dollars and a license or renewal fee of nine thousand six hundred and six dollars and uh the um, staff recommends adopting the resolutions uh, before you. Yeah. Okay. Any questions uh, from the council to the, the staff? Just, um, just one uh, quick yeah. question, Randy. Mayor. Uh -huh. The uh, two actually, but the first one is, you know, on the permitting fee per license, you gave us uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers, and the closest one to us is San Luis Obispo. And their fees is sixty-five thousand to ninety thousand. Um, we don't have anything closer to us that we could have recognized as important for us to look at. So the one uh, large um, chunk that was not included in our analysis was ordinance development. So the time spent by staff, council, city attorney, all those things 
to develop the actual ordinance over the last couple of years, all the meetings, all the, you know, the revised versions and all that. Those fees were not included based on the last council meeting when we we try to get an idea of generally how how far back we want to go at this. What we've done is included the fees of administrating and overseeing the um, licenses per year, but it doesn't go back and, and it's not trying to recover the um, ordinance development. Mm -hmm. But that is, we have those numbers if, if council was interested in pursuing that. So. Well, and, and then the other question related to that is how many uh, um, licenses does, let's say, the San Luis Obispo County have? Um, well, you know, we're looking at three. Are they looking at, are we looking at 300 for them? I mean, what? Not sure. I might be able to find that. Uh, well, if it's well, relevant. But we're, we're making, we're, we're using these to help us make a determination as to what type of fees we want to impose. And I just haven't seen anything in here um, that is recognizable to our. I, I know that Thousand Oaks have very high license fees, and they weren't don't have any licenses. Well, I'd also like to say I, be, I believe we we asked for kind of a, a high, medium, and, and low spread, so we didn't get that. We got one number for each one. So I, I don't know how much of the recovery this is. Is this intended to be a full recovery amount? If I can add a, a comment or two, this is what's proposed. The the fees that are listed are not full recovery because they they exclude the approximately thirty to forty thousand that has been spent on ordinance development. Our understanding from reviewing the materials, for for example, San Luis Obispo, is that they took the entire cost of cannabis, every time, every uh, percentage of time spent on that, and divided it across the number of licenses. And we did not do that. If the council wished to do so, that can be done. So, so this would be only the ongoing work, not the development of the ordinance. So, but this is a full recovery of everything but the development of the ordinance. Correct. Okay. Well. And, and along with that, the management of the ordinance, in other words, police time, fire time, um, um, I don't know who we're going to have in the city if we have to even create a position that's going to oversee cannabis in the future. But um, surely that has to be something that's related to the fees, am I correct? Yes, so the fees currently are based on city manager time, attorney time, police chief time, finance time, community development time because they do do zone, uh, zone clearance. And um, additionally, what the, the two things that are coming for these is compliance um, audits and then a financial audit. Um, so those two things have been included as well. Is that, is that why the annual license renewal is so much more expensive? Or let me ask that better. Why is the annual license renewal so much more than the application fee? Yeah, uh, thirty five hundred dollars would is going to what the what our what we're going to propose is that uh, we're working with HDL who does sales tax consultant. They they also are becoming uh, cannabis tax consulting gurus for the state too. So we're going to propose um, working with them to do a compliance uh, to to actually go make sure everybody's following you know the requirements and then to actually do a audit of sales uh, tax receipts. So that is $3,500 that uh, would have to be applied each year. And then, and then I'm sorry, Mayor, just in the same line, one last question on this is, um, there's also um, uh, state guidelines for inspections. Um, and along with that, we're gonna have to interact with those. So is that in this or is that coming down the road? That's part of the, the what HDL would be doing with the compliance uh, inspections. They, they would be going through with a checklist of items. And, and that's why we would look to, to them because they have expertise from doing this across the state. I, I understand that. I'm just looking for a, a dollar amount. Are we paying them to do that? Are they doing that service for free? No, they would be charging for that. It's uh, the, the amount uh, split among the applications would be 1500 per applicant. And so it's $1,500 per year. Okay. Okay. Uh, Bill. Uh, this ordinance would apply uh, the retail and delivery sales irrespective of whether a person had a legitimate county-issued medical card? Uh, yeah, the current proposal does not provide for any uh, discounts for those who have the county-issued medical patient cards. Right. That is, of course, within the council's options. Are those county-issued or state-issued? They are issued by the county under state provisions. Okay. Um, for what it's worth, for those who aren't familiar with these issues, <clears throat> the state excise taxes include an exemption if you have one of those cards. My understanding from our finance folk looking at the taxes is that there are very few 
uh, a number of sales that have the action, that fit in within that exemption. Um, uh, you in the on page five hundred six and five dash five. You call. You said a cannabis dispensary permit, cannabis delivery permit. Are, are there are there permits and licenses, or should that be appropriately labeled license? These are annual permits from the city. But are they permits or licenses? I think we've been calling them licenses. Fair point. We may be. Because uh, they're may licenses be. below, so these aren't. There's not like a permit. Be careful to call them licenses. I believe. Yeah, yeah. our ordinance is annual licenses. I misspoke. Right. Okay, so it's really the cannabis, the current cannabis dispensary license is seven hundred fifty dollars. Right. And is that annually? Yes. Okay. And there, that's the only other part of it. There's no right application. There's no separate application for your interview fee, and and the renewal is the same price at seven fifty. Is that correct? Yes. I, didn't we charge an application fee for the first round? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, you you are correct. The first round, which was done before my time a here, year a, and a half ago or there so. was an application fee yeah, and I, uh, I would ask the finance director to confirm but my recollection is that the application fees for the first round the first three which you'll recall began as purely medical uh, were a few hundred dollars that's correct my recollection off the top of my head was about 375 roughly and then um, then the council as the allowance for those businesses expanded to include recreational and include uh, full retail operations and a delivery operation, so too did the fees expand. It was $300. It was $300 originally, 300. thank you. Okay. And then it, now it's um, those annual fees, and then those are um, effectively annual renewal fees. Okay. Then to answer the question delivery. from earlier, San Luis Obispo has three <coughs> retail storefront permits. Three. <coughs> So, Mayor, I'll have more questions, but I think we should open it up. Yeah, that. I don't know. Well, I, I have one more question for the staff, actually. Okay. The, uh, in the writing of the ordinance, if it's going to be a general election, is there a necessity to have this public safety, roads of transportation, all these specific things that are really because in a special tax, you have to specifically list what the money will be used for. But since if we do go with a general tax, would all of that language be required in the ballot initiative or in no. the ballot language? Okay. Legally, all that's required is general city services. Okay. The, some cities include the rest of the language okay. to create uh, support. All right, thank you. Marketing. Okay, any other comment? I'll take public comment if you're... Um, no, I'll have a couple when, when it comes back. Okay, yeah. thanks, Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Matt Shoemaker, come on down, and uh, Jeff Kroll on deck. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council. My name is Matthew Shoemaker. I'm a co-founder of Ojai Greens. What I wanted to talk about is the tax that we're planning on proposing from 4% to 10% city tax. Um, I don't remember the gentleman's name that spoke earlier about the sales tax of seven and a quarter percent is a sales tax, which one of that goes to the city. So I, I kind of worked out some figures, and I'm going to try to bear with me while I go through some, some of the numbers on a hypothetical example. The excise tax, we pay the distribution companies 24% of the wholesale of product that we receive. An example, we spend $100 on a product, we pay them $124 up front. Okay? So if we order $50,000 in product, we're paying $12,000. Um, dollars in excise tax. So if we do a hundred thousand dollars in sales, twelve thousand goes towards the excise tax. Seven thousand two hundred and fifty dollars goes towards the state sales tax, and then fifty thousand is for cost of goods. If you subtract all of those, it leaves us with about thirty thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. That is not including how much it costs us to operate our business employees, security, um, uh, rent, utilities, marketing, all these different expenses that we actually have. And on top of that, we still pay federal taxes. Uncle Sam wants to make sure he gets his cut, but we are exempt from all tax advantages like a normal business owner. So all the people are, are asking for 4%, 10% growth, city tax. There are some cities in LA that do 
point, a, a fraction of a percent city tax in addition to the sales tax. Some, some cities like Huntington Beach does 1% city tax. There are some that do 5%. To me, I feel that it is a little outrageous to charge an extra 5% when 1% of the gross goes towards the city as of now. Um, I want everyone to really put that on in, in their mind and I want the public to know that as well, that we're, we're working so hard following all these compliance rules, but to charge an extra tax on the gross is, is really gonna put us in bad shape. It's gonna make us have to raise our prices of our products. It's gonna make the product price less affordable for the patient. And then it's gonna make the black market, which is the illegal sales of cannabis goods, which are unregulated, they don't have any overhead. It's gonna make them really just thrive because people are able to get it for a much cheaper price. Help me make sure that we kill the black market and don't allow us to you know, lose from this. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew? Uh, Jeff, Kroll. Good evening. Um, my name is Jeff Kroll, Shangri-La President. And what I'd like to say is, uh, first off, I've always been an advocate of paying our fair share. I do feel that um, it's a little high, to be honest with you. I think it's exorbitantly high when you compare the population centers that you're comparing us to. Uh, San Luis Obispo has almost 49,000 in population. They have three stores. We have three stores here. We have a population of 7,800 approximately. There's three competitors in that 7,800 market. A couple of the factors that are being based on this, and yes, it was $300 as the initial fee, but in the prior master fee schedule, it was listed at 350 I don't have a problem with the $750 renewal fee. We did pay um, an application fee when we first started, and it was medical only, but it was very simple to add adult in a simple approval of the city council and also getting a letter. It required also for me to pay more money with the state. Currently, right now, a million dollars in revenue of a business paying about $12,000 in state tax on an annual fee. That's not counting the 15% excise tax, the sales tax, and the burden of no write-off in our business. I do want to point out that some of the stats that are being relied on, and one of them is exhibit number D on the very bottom of the actual fee estimate. It's mentioned about H. Where, where, where are you? I'll wait till you get there. <laughs> Is it called? Attachment it? D. It's on the five, very bottom, HDL. What page? Guys? Attachment D, page one of one. I, only, I don't have an attachment. 5-25. One of one, attachment D. It's the very last page very last of this page. item. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. And it was revised on uh, May 30th, 2019. On the very bottom, of course, it, there's the $9,606.98. However, there's an annual compliance of HDL on a $1,500 fee. But as you know, it says audit every three years. But yet, on the column of addition, it's $2,000 being added. If we're being every three years, why is this being added to it? It should be $7,606.95. There's another issue, and that's the ordinance development. I think James will be able to answer that. Yeah, if, if I can, just to, to answer that question, is the fee is $6,000. So what we've done is instead of $6,000 every three years, it's $2,000 every year. That, so that's how we got so to 2000 2000 is, so 15 is every year and 2000 Yeah. Okay. Yes. Every three years? No. No, it, so the audit will be done every three years, but the cost of the audit is being broken down year Okay, year. all right, got it. Um, as I mentioned and I've had a couple of conversations with Captain Freyhoff, and Freyhoff has, you know, basically said, you know, I'm under the compliance of the state. The state controls my permit. The state's the one, as I go into my provisional license and permanent, they will be coming on a regular basis every quarter. That's what we've been told. So that compliance of state compliance to the rules is really the burden of the state that controls my permit. Of course, I need local approval for this, but I also feel that based on some of the 
cost and city. If you look at Oakland's population with over a million three hundred thousand, their fee is less than four thousand dollars. So that's it. This relationship of using uh, San Luis Obispo, I think, is not a, a correct uh, posture. Um, we will, of course, have to pay it if that's what the city so deems. I would like to note that on the master fee schedule that was just recently adopted by the city of Ojai on effective date just a couple of days ago, um, the traffic mediation is the highest element of cost. And basically it's the hospitals, the restaurants, and the high traffic areas that have to pay a traffic mediation. We have not been into that position, but the average cost of business licenses here in the city of Ojai, $25 up to $300. So why is this industry being singled out to pay so much? That's my concern. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. I think I see a late arriving piece of mail here. We'll be happy to take it, okay? Okay, <laughs> Bliss Page. First of all, I just want to say thank you for passing it. Oh, I'm so happy. Let, I, I read an article that people in the industry are saying that the feds are really going to decriminalize cannabis, maybe at the end of this year, maybe at the beginning of next year. And I read that they're thinking about having a federal excise tax that the feds could get, and that would be around, they're guesstimating about 15% on top of all the other taxes. I just wanted to tell you that so you guys could keep that in mind when you're thinking about taxes. Thank you. Okay. Well, can I ask a question? Thank you, Blizz. But does that, will that also mean that you get to deduct your business expenses? Yes, that is true. Okay. That is true. Okay. Okay, um, Bill. <laughs> no, go ahead. I, no, no, no. no. Add yeah, sure. Late yeah, oh. late, late, late testimony. Oh. <laughs> you're, you're up. Well, I thought he already spoke. He already spoke. He's filling out a card for someone else. Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, it's a card for somebody else. Right. Oh. Uh, Jordan Sorry. Davis. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to make one more simple point. Um, so my name is Jordan. Um, the point that I wanted to make is when the city and they're paying and the business are paying so much in taxes, it actually takes away from the businesses giving back to the community. For example, um, I don't know if you guys pay attention to Wainimi, but they were actually having financial problems as well. And the dispensaries in Wainimi were the ones that stepped up and help um, provide funding for that as well. And number two, if you guys paid attention to Santa Barbara, um, they're making it so strict and that actually caused problems with the cannabis industry, whether it's cultivation or retail, that <coughs> they were breaking laws because they felt that you know there was so much pressure that they weren't making money and wasn't as you know maybe worth as much of their time. And so just to take that into consideration, um, that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, uh, Bill. Um, well, I, I've been fairly consistent with this position, and, and I'll restate it. Um, first of all, small detail. Um, I don't know why we're not including testing in the list. I think if we have distribution, manufacturing, we also license testing. I don't know why we wouldn't include testing as well. Staff uh, would support and, inclusion of testing. I think that was an oversight given the fact that we don't have any at the moment, but certainly. Well, we don't have manufacturing either. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> we do. <laughs> well, not yet. <laughs> At least it's on it. Uh, but I, I want to make a, a, I'm a, a heartfelt plea to, for us to consider retail and delivery sales as a separate category uh, in terms of the minimums. And my reasons are as follows. Um, uh, one is that uh, there already is a sales tax on retail and delivery. There is not in those other categories, number one. Number two, uh, Cities um, have, are trending down on the retail and delivery sales percentage because they're realizing they get more tax revenue from having a low tax rate. And, um, and uh, retail and delivery sales, even though the number would be the same in a gross receipts, the, the fact is that that's a higher burden for that sector than the other sectors because of the, the lack of, of all, or, there's no uh, already general sales tax. Um, so I would, I would argue that, um, you know, uh, 
uh, and the last point I want to make is that assuming we want this to pass, frankly, having your retail customers see a very uh, low percentage for retail and delivery sales might make the difference in it getting it passed. Um, so I would, I'm going to argue for a very low minimum percentage on retail and delivery sales, uh, much lower than the one, uh, 4 percent, maybe 1 percent or a fraction of a percent, still something there. And I think there ought to be a medical carve out if you have a legitimate county card. That's how we treat uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, and uh, I, just <clears throat> I just think that um, we ought to seriously consider decoupling the uh, minimum for retail and delivery sales from the other categories. I have a quick question. Ryan. Uh, Mr. Summers, how many uh, cities have attempted to pass a cannabis tax and it's failed? It's not. It's above zero. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, somewhere between – uh, half a dozen to a dozen that have failed and the number that's been successful is something north of between 20 to 40. Mm -hmm. I can get you exact numbers uh, at a later date. I would point out that we had all, about a 75, almost close to a 75 percent vote for passing Prop 64 in the, uh, in the districts that amount to the city of Ohio. Mm -hmm. Have one more question. So, um, just a, 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 I, I know I'm going to be in, in the minority on some of my statements, which is fine with me. Um, the 75 percent of the population of the county approving it um, were not. Well, that's just the city. Of the city were not approving sales tax at the time. They were just approving that they thought the cannabis should be mm -hmm. available to the community. Mm -hmm. So this issue is entirely separate. That's that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is. Um, initially, this was brought to us on a medical um, issue solely, and I'm behind that 100%. So I'd be with you 100%, Bill, if we could carve out how not to tax medical. They have a county card. Right. So, so I'm for that. Now let's take it to recreation and take it to all the other aspects of this. And I think we're missing the boat on this. Um, I think this argument that I keep hearing that we need to make this business better for the business owner and I just don't agree with that. This is a cost of doing business, and that's just part of being a business person. And if you can't meet the business requirements, then what it does is it weeds you out, and businesses that can't create a profit margin and an attainable quality business will do so. So I don't think that we're in the business to be doing that. Um, so that's why I would prefer that the tax we start it instead at 10% that we actually go up to 18% so that down the road we're not tying the hands of future councils and having to increase this if cannabis takes off the way I believe all of us think thinks it will. Um, we can still come back to the 4% or the 5%, whatever we decide on tonight as the initial, but I, uh, I, don't, I think we're limiting ourselves and creating more of a problem down the road if we don't start higher um, than the 10%. Then one last thing I want to read into it, Mayor, and this is where I believe cannabis is going, and we can all laugh at it, and I'm not a big fan of bringing newspaper articles to the council, but I was up in Oregon this past weekend, a Russian billionaire in cannabis consolidation. So cannabis is a lot bigger up there than it is in Ojai, um, and it's probably bigger than it is in California, but we'll exceed it. You watch, we're bigger. Um, it's a $4 billion business up there. It's the fourth largest business in the state of Oregon. So we're kidding ourselves if we don't think cannabis isn't heading in that direction in the state of California and in Ventura County. So again, from a business perspective, if you can't meet the roll call to operating and running a business, you shouldn't be in business. That's how I feel. I deal with that on a daily basis as a businessman in this community and in this county. Okay, <laughs> let's talk to each other rather than at the end. Okay. Just, and, then, okay. and then one last note on that too, Mayor, is it's just important to understand the black market because there's this, this unwavering um, cry that if we just do this, that will stop. And the reality is it doesn't. 
It's going to be there and it's going to be a constant no matter what we do. That black market will continue. Okay, I have one uh, card late from an old acquaintance, Chris Hilger. Okay. Come on up. You can, we'll give you, um, give you your three minutes to. Uh, Chris Hilger is uh, Park Road. Um, I, I do not have a dog in this hunt at all. I, um, I am a candidate for medical marijuana, but I, I haven't used it. I just had a nice conversation with a short tail friend of mine who was a uh, who was uh, on the planning commission four years as a council member in uh, Breckenridge, Colorado, and uh, I look at it as a very big issue, and that um, it's more than it's more than just a business. It's a turn in the way the country is going, and I look at the people that are standing on the council now, and I look at it as a as actually a morality issue. And they look at it from that point of view is all the time years ago when I was running an egg plant and did 265,000 eggs a night, burned the candle at both ends with two jobs. I had some guys in the cooler that I couldn't handle because I didn't know what was going on until somebody told me they were not performing their work and not doing well. And I look at it as an obligation for you people that are on the council to make serious decisions because uh, any way you stand, it's not in my opinion, at 85 years old, it's somewhat of a gateway thing and it's not good for the younger people and what I worry about is the potency of happening to some of these things and how it's going to affect our community. So if you people on the council have any influence in, in containing it or regulating it, you should have that power and beware of what you're letting out to the general public. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Okay. I have another uh, question. Bill. This is really an administrative question for the city manager, and I'm referring to the second to last paragraph on page 5-4 in the discussion of defining gross receipts, where the proposed cannabis general tax ordinance has been revised to define gross receipts for the cannabis microbusiness to include the gross receipts earned or which would be earned if the product was sold for each of the three stages of cannabis microbusiness, manufacturing, distribution, and retail. In other words, a value-added tax. The City Council could alternatively only tax the final gross receipts of a microbusiness once its products are sold or otherwise adjust the proposed tax rates. What kind of administrative challenge are we looking at in terms of trying to define what would be earned if the product was sold? That phrase worries me in terms of administrative nightmare as opposed to just simple gross receipts once the products are sold. I have the same concern. I think that was actually one reason why in our fee, uh, proposed fees, we included the HDL um, tax services because uh, my goal would be to, to outsource that to them and have it be their problem. Yeah. Although, we, you know, obviously yeah, that, we, would, that's a, we would work with that's them. That's a thorny, uh, it's simple to track final gross receipts. It's not simple to look at components. Right. All right. Okay, Ryan. The, the, the issue is that if you allow a micro business who operates a uh, distribution as well as manufacturing as well as retail, um, that they will be at a substantial competitive advantage over someone that may just be doing retail or otherwise. And if, as, as was just told to us, there's a 24% markup on distribution for certain parts, for certain cannabis products, if one has to pay that 24% and the other one doesn't uh, because they can distribute it to themselves, we are essentially creating an uneven playing field. We've looked at this, we've thought about it, we've looked at other places, it's, there's no perfect answer, it's really difficult. But if we're gonna allow the micro business model, we have to figure out a way that versus a standalone distributor or a standalone manufacturer, how we can make sure that those two are simply not going to be playing on completely different fields because one would have to pay tax for each one of their activities while the other one would only have to pay tax on the gross receipts when it got to the retail end. Can I just That's ask a question to clarify my own thinking on this? Oh, it's, it's, it, but what uh, we're like talking about is if we, what we are, in, what, what this says is that it would not be allowed to, for example, manufacture your own product, distribute it for one cent, and then retail it at $100 and only pay the 4% on the $100 and pay 4% on one cent. But if you're and distributing to another party, you're gonna, that's going to be a sale. But when you're not distributing to another party. Right, you're just, you're just uh, selling it yourself. Right. So it goes into the cost of the sale. If you sell it to yourself for a cent and then you sell it for $100 retail, how do you figure that? How is that equal? versus having to pay full price from a distributor. 
And this is what other cities have done. We, we didn't figure this out ourselves. Well, that's what I don't understand. You're not actually distributing if you're just selling your own product. You actually are because you can't legally manufacture it and then sell it yourself. You have to go through a distributor. And that's why the micro business model exists partly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> not from the audience, please, Jeff. But can so yes, clarify? You, uh, thank you. Yeah, simply, Just simply. A second, let's get back under control me. here. Yeah. We got the questions here. Okay, Is it's the, really difficult. Part of part of what the reason why we looked at a percentage tax is because as this industry grows bigger, which we anticipate it may, that we will capture more of the revenue. We also looked at it and said, based on the models they currently have and how low the current fees are. We didn't want to burden these businesses with huge upfront costs and kill their cash flow. We thought it would be better to have a percentage on the back end. The other thing is we've been talking at various times about transit occupancy tax increases and about sales tax increases. And I am staunchly against a sales tax increase for the entire city, which would encumber our residents with paying that tax versus a transit occupancy tax or these types of cannabis taxes. I would much rather we're, we're capturing those additional funds that we're looking for through this by allowing these businesses to come to us and said, we want to we want to grow. And frankly, this council who put these three dispensaries in and didn't have any taxes on it whatsoever, paying their fair share versus us going out to the entire community and saying we want to increase the sales tax and further increase the cost of living in Ojai. No supplemental extra taxes. They're paying sales tax. Well, it's regardless, it's an additional sales tax that everybody's going to pay versus one that's industry specific, like transit occupancy taxes. Okay, and when well, we say uh, we don't treat this industry like anything else, we clearly do treat other industries like this. Okay, let's bring her back to, did you? Uh, I would did, like did, to uh, hear what. Uh, uh, do you talk to the chair and the okay. chair will then answer you. You would, like to hear, would you like to hear <laughs> what Jeff, what like Jeff to, may be yes, able to contribute? because I, I, I need, okay, I need okay. clarification. You just, you I would appreciate that. Jeff, if you'd like to step forward and uh, be concise if you can. Uh, yes, sorry, <laughs> There's a misconception that the just if we were a micro business that we're not paying the 15% at the retail level. The way track and trace works and manufacturing works, once you finish a product, you register it with track and trace. It's then recorded at a volume of what you made and what you're going to charge for it. It then goes to the distributor. The distributor takes the 15% from cultivators at $9.25 a pound or the 15% at the retail. I will still have to pay the 15% even if I'm a distributor myself to myself. I still am required to pay the 15%. So it's not that you don't pay it. You do. Well, Even the, in a micro. Okay, but, but the 15% right, is right. going to the state, not to the city. Uh, that's correct. If you allow me to clarify, that's all state excise taxes. Right. None of that would be the city's tax. So in other words, uh, Mr. Wyrick, the, the same, well, the, this yeah. model is how the state works as well. I know it's really weird. But we benefit. It's really weird we, to operate your own business <coughs> and this have multi-tax levels, in, you know, trading it amongst your own hands. But the track, now the other problem with the track and trace program or the seed to sale program is that it's not implemented everywhere. It had, nobody, not everybody's using it yet. So even though they're required to, the state hasn't got it rolled out and been very efficient in getting, making sure it's working correctly. Otherwise, the HDL situation would be there. And we look at the two other states that have gone down this path in Colorado and Oregon. Oregon had lost control of it by going way out of bounds, by, by authorizing everything, which is why we have a newspaper here with Russian oligarchs buying up uh, you know, cannabis assets in Oregon. Absolutely. And then we have Colorado, who's done a very meticulous job of doing it and is now seeing the massive amount of profits that were promised. And those 75% of people who voted for it we're also promised a lot of tax benefits to the community. And I think they would rather see, without speaking for them, the taxes paid on this. And I'll tell you, as a person who is going to pay these taxes, I would, you know, sales tax is going to be cheaper for everybody, but it's going to burden our community significantly. Now, we may have to do all of them together, but we're looking at this for the sole purpose of trying to make it consistent with all these things and, and, and make up for these fees and the application fees and everything else, which is why I, I would be more for a higher level of taxes. Now, maybe 4% maybe is not the right number, but I would much rather see us recover the money through taxes, through the use of these products and the sale of these products, than I would in larger permitting fees. And either way, we're gonna, they're going to the city coffers, so they're all going the same place, and burdening these businesses with steep annual costs 
which, uh, you know, they got to make a quarter million dollars at 4% before they get 10 grand. That's a lot of cash flow problems. And I also like the idea that we can be flexible. If the federal government does allow this, then we can look at it and say, okay, now if you're getting the benefit of these write-offs, like a normal business, now we can look at it differently. And, and, and I'm, I'm happy to entertain the idea of balancing these fees into a lower percentage for retail. I'm absolutely for carving out a medical exemption, but I do want to make sure that we are um, not losing sight that these amount of taxes are not nearly as substantial as they even are in other industries in our own town that are flourishing. Okay, Susa, your turn. Uh, well, I'm more inclined to support what Council Member Weirich said, but my middle path would be to do 3% three, 3%. Be, simply because they no, do not get normal business deductions. That's the primary reason. So 4% seems a little, seems from my perspective, high. 3% seems more like a middle path between okay, uh, uh, Randy and... and uh, I'd like to ask a question of the city attorney. Are these percentages uh, discretionary on the part of the council and just simply an indication to the voters as to what is uh, planned or are these a lock-in? No, it would be discretionary. The way this is structured is if the council adopts both the resolution putting it on the ballot and the resolution setting the initial tax rates, then it can be truthfully stated in the, resolu in the ballot label that the council has set initial rates at X percent, whether three or four or what, whatever metric you've set. Not to exceed ten. The, the, right. so the non-discretionary component now. is the not to exceed uh, presently 10 that could be adjusted to be higher. The, re the reason my question simply is, is do we have to resolve whether it's three, whether it's no. eight uh, tonight? I don't, it didn't no, you don't no. have to resolve it, but the only the issue is if it's not resolved, it can't be in the ballot label. The ballot label has to be truthful. So if you haven't set the initial <laughs> and, and it's rates. Kind of a and, and what is truth I like, <laughs> Well, that, that, in other words, if you haven't adopted initial rates, then the ballot label needs to be adjusted to say something about how the council can set rates at a lower, okay, at a no, lower so component, but you won't have initially set them. So I'm going to ask you. You can also defer the whole thing until you've just made the other decision. I'll and ask the council to be very truthful tonight and have a motion here of what we want to do. Uh, that's, what, that's what we saw other communities have done, is they would say we, we're doing it up to, we're authorizing our city to go up to this percentage, but we're starting it here, so it's very clear where the number is going to be at the beginning. Okay, do we have a motion? Uh, okay, but I, have one, I just have one more question, sir. <laughs> I didn't um, get to it's, it's a clarification. Okay, just one one second. I didn't get to finish. So can we? I'll be right back. We, we have we have two, at least two separate issues. We did ever it didn't seem like we didn't finish our discussion about the application fee, the interview fee, the annual life. That's light. correct because we have no motion. Uh, and so what I'm going to try to do is to get us focused on both those things. I'm not trying to wrap the whole thing together. Okay. okay. Right. Well, well uh, to me to the, that. Let me, let me hang on a second. Um, it's really hard to keep track of, of both these two separate things, the, the fees and the taxes. So I would like our discussion to zero in on the fees, and I want to clarify what full recovery means and I want to clarify if there, uh, to me, all. Okay, and we'll do that when we get to get to a, to a motion. Let's have one question from Randy, and I'll okay. come back to you. Randy. Well, I just wanted to clarify the word. Um, we keep stating in here that there'll be no cultivation of cannabis in the city of Ojai. Right. We make that clear almost every other page. Mm -hmm. And then we get to page 513, attachment A, exhibit A, three of eight, and um, we have in the word in there propagation. So uh, as far mistake. as I'm concerned, propagation and cultivation go hand in hand. So do we just want to strike that word propagation? And isn't there personal? Well, remind me again which subsection I'm looking So it's going to be uh, subsection, oh, it's right. exhibit A, attachment A, page 3 of 8, and it's line H-I-J-K-L, manufacture means. And in there we have production, preparation, propagation, or compounding, and I just want to I'd like to strike the word propagation because propagating and cultivating are one and the same. Mm. So I would just like to strike that word. That can be done. What I'll note is that Exhibit A is the adopted manufacturing ordinance that was approved last time. Deleting that word is a Scrivener's error because of the council's intent was very clear. So we can delete that word with no further action from Great. the council. Great. The clerk okay. and I have that power. Okay. Okay. Good Thank point. You. Okay. Good point. You have a motion. 
I, I do, Your Honor. Okay. Do, Your Honor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whoever has a motion, I'll, I'll be thrilled. No. All right. Um, can I please ask one more uh, question? You know Wait okay. till there's a motion, then you can ask right. a question. Yes, All right. I, I'll make a motion that we uh, pass the ordinance as written with the following modifications. That we reduce retail taxes to 3%, manufacturing to 3%, distribution to 3%, while we keep the up to 10% level. And that we reduce the application fee in half and the annual license renewal fee in half of what they're currently recommended. And everything else minus the uh, proclamation, including, sorry, the amendment for the proclamation word. Um, would okay, be you, okay, you went to 3% and then you went to what? Did you go over to the application? Three on all of them and then half on the application fees. And the uh, carve out for county? Um, excuse me, including the carve out for county uh, medical so card holders. Yes, for county medical card holders. That would be 0% for them. Correct. Okay. Now, okay. Okay, that's, that's a motion. A Do we have a second to that motion? Does anybody agree with that? I'll second it. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Okay, Susan, okay. ask your question. My question is uh, this outfit that you're going to consult with. Why, uh, it, it, okay, maybe I'm missing something, but we're making these decisions and then how do they play in? Why aren't we being consulting with them first? So HDL is the agency we use right now for yeah, sales HDL, tax yeah. consulting. Uh -huh. So they um, audit, they audit yeah. our sales tax collections and tell us where we're missing things, what adjustments we need to make all, and, and all that type of stuff. So <coughs> we, would plan on just using them to do the tax collect, you know, auditing and, and um, uh, audit, tax auditing services for the cannabis taxes as well. And they have become kind of the big, um, the, the agency that a lot of cities are using for those purposes. Okay. They're not a policy consultant. Okay, right? that's, that was they're what not I a needed. Policy oh. consultant. Okay, no, okay. Yeah, so, accountants, all right. right. That's what I wanted to be clear on. Okay, could thank I, you. Could I suggest yeah. a, uh, I, I might have misheard, of course. a friendly amendment suggestion that we include testing in the categories? I, I, I well. Or not, I mean, I, I'm, just, I'm curious. I don't think that the testing stage should include costs to the individuals because it's to the benefit of the individuals and they're going to make their own money. It, 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 look, if you test it, you got to sell it through all these other ways. So I just think why add one more layer? And the testing, it, if it adds a tax, it adds a cost, but it's directly to the benefit of the individuals. So I just, I just don't think we necessarily need one on the so testing you, you can still make a motion if you okay. want well, to I just add, no, Okay, I, no, I, okay. No, okay. That's my opinion. Okay, Mayor, so I would just like to clarify. Uh, or me, Randy. So, the, so all of the... Uh, Percentages went down from four to three, and then I just want to pee the, 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 be clear on the fee schedule, the five thousand, the nine eighty, and the nine thousand. You're saying cut those in half? Uh, you know, I I would say the interview fee is probably correct, but I would I would my motion is to uh, well my motion was to reduce all of them in half. I think I said it backwards one time, but I will amend my own motion and say I would have the application fee and the annual license and renewal fee cut in half of what is in the recommendation, but the interview fee can stay the same. And, and, and to be clear, my understanding is the initial rates can be adjusted down or up in the zero to 10 percent racket? Correct. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Now, what does that mean? That means if that if, if, um, st if you're not recovering the cost, you can, you can do what? So if the, the rates is independent of cost recovery, if the at the council's desire for any reason or no reason the council could increase or decrease the taxes either all of them across the board or individually for the different business lines between zero and ten percent if it passes we can go if, up yeah, or down. You know, but, uh, uh, but, but separately you could re increase the fee schedule as well to reflect is yeah, to the I'm highest asking. level so that does not require a vote of the people to do that no that, no, no yeah, the fees that, are independent that, of the prop price. two yeah. the, it's, it's just prop 26 yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and, and I want to say again that they, you know, we have, we have part of the, part of the reason I believe the fees should be reduced a little bit is, and, and I don't want to be, you know, we don't want to charge different fees, to different applicants, obviously we can't do that, but some of these are going to be new applicants and some are existing ones. And it doesn't seem appropriate to saddle them with such high upfront costs. If they're willing to go into this industry, they're willing to be competitive. We've gone through this work and they're, and we, we pass this tax, then we're going to receive hopefully much more than this, but why burden them with all these other things that they're talking about with upfront costs? Why burden them with that? It'll kill their cash flow, make it much more difficult to get started. We want to see them succeed. Easiest way to do that is make sure they have enough cash on hand to get their feet up and running. Yeah. Well, I support that. Yeah. And I also know that that will allow them to donate to the community. I'll as, help them as, donate to uh, the community. 
one Chelsea. And, and with that, yeah, I want to I want to <laughs> say too, we we did get notice that uh, Sespe Creek Collective, uh, after I I would assume after some discussions last week or maybe just on there, uh, donated I believe five thousand dollars to the uh, fa Ohio Fam Ohio Valley Family Shelter, um, which is pretty cool. Okay, yeah, I, I like All your. Right. I'm like good that. with your motion. I'm good. I'm good. Okay, we have a motion and we have a uh, second. Any further discussion? You want to amend the, th the ceiling? They're not going to amend it, so I, why waste my breath? Yeah, Let's okay. go. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, let's have a roll call. Mayor Pro Tem Francina? Yes. Council Member Wyrick? Yes. Mayor Johnston? Yes. Council Member Blatz? Yes. Council Member <laughs> Haney? No. I hope you vote for your own motion. <laughs> hey, are we going to work on the on the um, ballot statement? Uh, yeah. That was just adopted. We just passed that. Well, oh, I, without as but we, you can. Oh, I, I won't. With I'd the, like to amend what we just passed. I'd like to do a motion for reconsideration regarding the ballot language. That'd be fine. Strictly or whatever we need to do to. Does that need to be done tonight or can? No, I, can we can we push that down the road, Matt? Uh, sure. You don't you have to do, do it tonight. I think what I'd like but, to, if yeah. it's possible, instruct staff not to include that in any formal finalized part. Yeah, but we can start the, the detail. Well, I'm, okay, I apologize. Yeah. You've adopted a resolution submitting this matter to the voters, which means you've adopted a resolution including the ballot label language. Yeah. You can change it later if you wish, and there's okay. plenty of time between now and the election. But you did just do that. I, I did. You're right. And I did forget okay. that okay. I wanted to discuss that. But I think it'd be better for another night. So. Okay. So but, you, so, but we're changing to, it to, to make 3%? It to not be specific mm -hmm. about the that, usage. Yeah. Well, I, I get that. That, that wasn't done. the motion. The, yeah, that was want, why, do, why don't, doesn't the subcommittee get together on the language that they like to suggest That's fine. for yes. some future meeting? Thank okay. you. And then we can bring back a resolution changing the ballot label, be, right, reflecting the fact that the ballot label doesn't go to the county until about three months before the election. That's August of 2020, so there's time. Okay. And I basically, so you want the, a period with, where the comma is after services. Yeah, and it's obviously it's going to have to change from 4% to 3 But right. well, that would be built in to what okay. you've just done. And also the math would be run to change the okay. 620 to whatever 3% is. Okay. Oh, yeah, we can certainly, you have plenty of time to change the ballot label itself. Okay, that was my mistake, Matt, okay. but we'll, we'll motion, bring it back later. Motion is okay. carried, and the staff okay. is directed to work with the subcommittee, come back with some language. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, I thought that was very nice of uh, one of the operators to contribute to the homeless shelter effort or showers, and I would hope the other uh, businesses that are operating at least would do the same. Yeah. The churches can use all the help they can get right now. Okay, we're going to uh, number six, active, uh, the ATP. Uh, James? <coughs> so I'll do just a Quick introduction, then I'll hand it over to uh, our Public Works Director, Mr. Grant. But um, this item is returning. It was on the last uh, council agenda. Uh, some modifications were requested. Staff has made uh, modifications uh, in response to that. And Mr. Grant, if you, if you want to add to that. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council again. And uh, I guess as the City Manager just mentioned, I guess uh, we all know the ATP, the Active Transportation Program acronym project. Uh, this is all about awarding the design consultant only, just as a reminder. Uh, the report is fairly extensive coverage of various items, but on page four, there is a, uh, a schedule for the ATP. As a reminder, the award of the contract is immediate. I think we had a typo there and said March from the, when this came to the council previously. Uh, but the design phase will occur uh, we'll try to move this contract immediately, uh, hoping and for award tonight. And it'll take about one year for us to obtain Caltrans permitting and special design exceptions as well as the right of way. There's certain right of way issues that have to be delineated here. So we're we'll under a tight deadline. The, uh, the Maricopa Highway uh, lane reduction demonstration is a reminder. I think that's one of the questions that was answered by staff. You requested we come back and address. And that uh, is a SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments, has their own ATP funding for this. So they have to go through the same process we do. They have to uh, RFP consultants, go through the state federal process to select consultants. They have to have award that contract. Uh, and this is after the CTC allocates the money. And then that consultant will meet with us, design the project, and then they need to permit it with Caltrans. 
acquire all the contracts to actually install it and then operate it for about six months. So we're going to try to get that to happen as early as we can through in the school year. Uh, we're shooting for March, uh, somewhere in the March, April. March is probably going to be the earliest we can get it started. It'll go for six months after that. Uh, the, the final design approval for Caltrans is scheduled for August. The reality is we have until December, and we have a little slack in there because there will be hang-ups in this project, uh, this design phase. And then the uh, CTC, or the California Transportation Commission, funds need to be allocated by, uh, I believe, the drop debt is January 2021, uh, but there's some issue with meeting dates and so on, so we're shooting for the December 2020 meeting. And then construction would start uh, in 2021 and proceed for depending on a few factors approximately a year. There's, keep in mind this doesn't have huge impacts to our actual ongoing traffic flow. Most of these curb ramps just like any of the small ones you do around town will be curb extensions and so on down on the side of the road. You still have the major pathway of the road uh, operating and then uh, a lot of this will be behind the curb sidewalk infill tree infill and so on and uh, and then at the final phase, we're working with Caltrans to do the overlay after we're done with all that flat work and then do the final striping at that time. So uh, I think one of the questions council will push for is, can you please summarize the um, outreach effort? And that was attachment uh, B to the admin report. You'll see uh, 12 city council actions that were taken, which are considered public and available to the public. Some of those were significant outreach, outreach efforts. Some were lesser uh, authorizations to proceed with the grant and outlines of what the grant was about. Uh, and then below that, we have public and focus group outreach efforts. And there's an extensive list of 26 meetings uh, from focus groups to full public outreach. I think the public outreach, there was focus groups up front to try to get input from uh, certain uh, stakeholders like utilities and fire department, police department, and others, and uh, the downtown merchants and uh, hospital, school, and so on. And then uh, later, there's major general public meetings that were held. So that hopefully addresses your concerns there. As well as on the back, it goes on. The Ojai Valley News has had extensive uh, coverage, uh, cover articles, uh, smaller articles, numerous editorials, which I think are ongoing to this date. And uh, I, an important one to mention as well is Complete Street's uh, master plan was an extensive outreach effort. And a big part of that was really people looking for pedestrian and bike improvements on Ojai Avenue as well as Maricopa. So that, if you look at that master plan as a reminder, it has uh, the various proposals out of Maricopa as well as everything we're doing through the city. So those were kind of a separate project that was adopted by the council, a master plan. Uh, I think the other probably more primary thing the council wanted uh, addressed was what is the functionality of the proposed lane reduction during emergencies and uh, that was a report was prepared by a consultant a supplemental traffic evaluation of that situation it was uh, reviewed as a draft format by the fire department city police county sheriff which is affiliated of course and overlaps with the city police the CHP, California Highway Patrol, and uh, they all agreed with the findings of the report that essentially the functionality of the four-lane uh, segment of Maricopa as an internal connector would remain unchanged if reconstructed as a two-lane segment as proposed. That's the first bullet underneath that section. And then that a reconstructed two-lane segment will have the same capacity as each of the six two-lane roadways that provide ingress and egress out of the valley. I think that was the biggest point that everybody made. We're really talking about a 0 0.5 to 7 uh, linear mile segment of four lanes, but everything around it is two lanes. So it's, uh, if you can imagine, it might be easier to see, but if everybody was trying to get to Ventura in a mass exodus, the four lanes in Oakview are not going to help that capacity. It's kind of like a pipe with a a thick piece of pipe in the middle of a small pipe it just doesn't a six help. inch pipe but if everything's three quarter going in doesn't matter <laughs> right so now, that, more importantly is more importantly with that analogy is that uh, an oversized pipe gives you a sense of greater flow but the reality is the restriction on each end of it does not change the actually flow. restricts total flow so that's the most important thing to understand yeah. in that yeah. right and that's what you're arguing and I and and I don't disagree with that 
Okay. Greg, could you just repeat the exact length of that two point? Uh, the section from the wide El Roblar, I think, uh -huh. is about point, 0 0.7 miles, three quarters of a mile. Okay. But it's yeah. not all having lane reduction, right? As you get up to the Y, they'll be opening up for additional lanes. Seven miles. So, <laughs> yeah, the actual lane reduction occur approximately 0.6. It's not a final design yeah. yet. So it's roughly, it approaches a half a mile. Uh, and Mr. Grant, how many, how many residential houses are in that stretch? Do you know? I would estimate zero. Single family residence. I mean, Creekside, the condominium complex might be. Right, there. set back on Carrillo. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's two condominiums. But other than that. Yeah, so and then the them. wagon wheel complex is off of Church over there. Yeah. But that has another egress, right? If right. If you had to go north. They yeah, once like east and around it. Oh, and east and around. From yeah. there, you can use it. But I do think Creekside is locked up. So, But that would be the one residential area that would probably need to use that road significantly. Well, I, I mean, keep in mind, I think last time there was a case made by uh, a doctor that came in and spoke uh, articulately somewhat about the issue. But he was saying he was concerned about response time. And when we address that with the hospital and the ambulance service, just to keep that clear, uh, it's very difficult to come up with a case where you're going to have congestion on that roadway out there. Yes, if there was some mass exodus, uh, there would be blocked roadways, and it's going to make it difficult to get around. That would, and that's, uh, but it's really not much different than, I mean, downtown, Ojai Day, July 4th, we shut down the main quarter in downtown. And I also uh, think in Creekside, if I remember correctly, because I love to talk about places I lived in Ohio, I used to live in Creekside for a little bit. <laughs> Where haven't you lived there? <laughs> yeah. There's a bench in the park that's still <laughs> waiting to get my name on it. Um, <laughs> I think there's a fire uh, exit there that, yeah, that, yeah. that on the, I don't know, you know, whatever road that. I can't remember the road that goes to Nordoff Cemetery. Uh, Kuyama. Kuyama. Right. I think there's a uh, and that from from are you saying from uh, the hitching post or from uh, no from Creekside? Creekside. That Creekside. That you could actually egress. Yeah. Like if there's a fire there, the yeah. fire trucks can get in through there. If you can, mm, open I'm that not gate. sure about that, but I do know the hospital with their renovation is actually creating an access road. Yeah. So right. the hospital will have two points of access. Right. Okay. I think it's a good idea to check okay, on do that. Okay, uh, uh, Greg, are you finished with your uh, presentation? Uh, I am. Uh, I think I covered the major points, and uh, it, it's all there in the report as well, so I'll be glad to answer any further questions. Okay, I have one question for you regarding the Nordoff High School uh, access uh, coming from uh, the okay. west, uh, south side of the highway. The idea of, of cutting an apron or a, an entryway and bringing it in to get the, those cars out of the way so the people coming from the other direction. Yeah. Now, that, I know that's part of the overall design, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then one of the questions was, is that, uh, you know, do we do that uh, concurrently with other things we're doing early, but then there's some cost associated with that. Uh, is there no way to... Uh, to do that concurrently where we get the, at least apply for the permits. So in the event this thing gets tied up, we're not waiting three years to uh, uh, try to alleviate the, the traffic problem that already exists. We can absolutely go ahead with the design and uh, the permitting of it, proceed with that. And uh, there's some consideration that the SCAG grant may cover some of that money. So we were yeah. hoping to wait till the SCAG grant rolls a little bit to see okay. if we can combine. The cost could be in the seventy to hundred thousand dollar price range. I'd really say fifty to hundred. I think we have a cost of as high as a hundred, but it's not designed yet, so it's hard to nail down. But uh, there's a decent chance that it, it's part of the demonstration, so they would cover a portion of that cost, but they're not going to cover a full build out with that extensive a cost. We didn't factor uh, that into the grant. So, can I ask you a question along with that? Uh, uh, has there been any study? from the school side of this. We're talking about our money and we're talking about our um, responsibility, but the reality is everything south of that curb is the, is, um, the school districts. Mm -hmm. So what arrangements have been made with them to provide some type of a traffic study for their parking lot? And uh, I'm not even sure that you would, you know, uh, I've been going to that school for 25 years. Um, it peaked in attendance at 2002 and 2001. Why didn't this school at that time with all of that traffic decide they needed another curb cut? They didn't because they're trying to manage the two exits that they have. So adding another one 100 feet or 100 yards, it wouldn't be 100 yards, it'd be 100 feet from the other one. 
how, how is that advantageous? I, I, I'm still lost on that, and I haven't seen anything that says what the advantage is. And now we're talking about sharing the cost of it, which makes no sense to me. It, could I? Well, the only on qu the other question I was raising, Randy, was just is if if that is going to be part of the ultimate solution, is there a way to do this in parallel so that we're not, you know, kind of critical path analysis? Uh, why wait on something that we either way maybe needs to be done or not? And if it, if it's the determination it's not needed, that's a, a, a separate issue. We're not going to design it tonight. I was just curious if there if that issue had been addressed. And it sounds like you say yes. And I, if I, if I you want me to address, Mr. Councilman Haney's sure. qu just yeah, to yeah, make yeah. Uh, kind of throw out the concept again. Yes, there is no need for it right now because uh, when you're leaving the Y, heading to Church Street and you pull into that left-hand turn pocket to turn into the driveway, uh, you're oftentimes held up. Now, we've studied that for weeks at a time, and on a sporadic moment in the mornings, you might see that left turn lane stack and kick into the number one lane briefly, generally under 15 seconds. But right now, you've got room to get because by. Because you have two lanes there. Right, you've got two lanes. So when you, you go limit to one, one it's going to change get from 15 one, you've seconds got an issue. to so whatever. The, so the solution is the driveway cut, because the only reason people are stacking in that left turn lane is coming from the Miners Oaks side, people come in and get stuck trying to get into the parking lot and they stack in their weight. So it just oh. jams up the driveway. So this is a way to, to route So you're going to have better. a route for a left turn lane coming north. And what you're going to have is the Minor Oaks, the Minor Oaks traffic come in and having their own egress into the school by that new curb cut. That's yeah. what you're yes. saying. Yes, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bill. Just a real quick comment, uh, Mr. Grant. We forget sometimes that we have something in our code called the thoroughfare, thoroughfare corridor overlay, right. which includes some really good principles of how, now I know that they don't have to follow our code. I, I got that, the school did. But I'm thinking the fact that we have those principles in the code might be a good kind of information to bring into a discussion with the new superintendent and maybe include in some of the discussions about the demonstration grant. Uh, just to say, you know, let's let's apply what we've what, some principles that are already built into our code on a mutual voluntary basis. Um, I just I just want to point that out that we've got something there that is almost a design guideline built into our code. Okay, I saw that email circling and I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd also like you to talk to them about redirecting their own funding. Yes, they have they they are they're, they're sitting on millions of dollars. Thirty million. They yeah. just need they just need to reprioritize and how important that is. And if it's important to this community to change our way, it should be important for I them agree. to do the same. I agree. And I, and, I, and I am just adamantly opposed to spending any of our money on school district property. I'm just... Yeah. just but we might be able to work with them to get some grant money. Okay, guys. Uh, well, let's get back to the topic at hand. We have a motion to... Uh, I would move to approve. Okay. Oh, I still have a couple more questions. I'll, 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 Wait a minute. We're not I'll voting. Second. We're just getting a motion, I'll please. Second. I'll second. Uh, do I have a second? If I don't, I, I, I second your motion, okay. Bill. Okay, and now. I, I just want to say that this is not just for the school district. This impacts everyone on that street. The traffic flow into the school impacts everyone. Okay? And uh, Councilmember Weirich and I and Bob Daddy were out there in 110 degrees yesterday, scoping it out again. And what you see now is just a, a, a strictly car-dominated infrastructure. It's like a used car lot. I was so tired riding my bike in the heat, there was not a bench in sight. So what we want to do is we're, you know, we're, we're you this, is, this is the, this is the future, okay? This okay. is, you know, this is, you can keep yes. your old dinosaur ideas about traffic, you know, okay. that's fine uh, the, with me. The motion before <laughs> us is whether or not to approve a contract for design, <laughs> not to redesign the road ourselves. So uh, do you need anything else? I say that with love. <laughs> yes, I felt, <laughs> I felt the love. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so we've got a motion and a second. Are we going to or not? Are we going to? Uh, so, well, I still have more questions as soon as we, as soon as you get a second. We got a second. Okay, so can we continue? Yeah, do you have a question? Did you oh, just yeah, have a lot more questions. Oh, I've got to take the opportunity. Is this a filibuster every, to stop I have to the, take the, the road project, or is this actually going to? Oh, no. Well, like I said, you guys know where I stand on it. I just don't agree with it. So, um, and I, I disagree with it for a number of reasons. Um, and it has nothing to do with Sousa riding her bike there. 
it has everything to do with, I think, is the waste of money. But we're not going to talk about that. We're talking about a study, and I agree with that. <laughs> okay? So the question I just had on here, you had the following is the overall schedule for the project, and you talked about the consulting and how um, th that need has to be done by uh, July 2020, Greg. Um, and then you brought in the Caltrans approval. W is, when does Caltrans actually start <coughs> approving this project? We're not going to wait till it's fully designed. Are they going to actively participate and engage with us on the 30, the 65, and the 95? Yes, they have an assigned team to, that's already been working okay. with us on this project. And, and how are we going to get the feedback from that entity? How does that work? Uh, on a monthly basis, we have a meeting. Uh, we've been doing conference calls to this point and uh, a couple face to face. But at this point, it's one of the advantages of this consultant. Their office is right adjacent, uh, a couple of blocks away from Caltrans. So the intention is to have uh, ongoing face to face meetings to expedite reviews. This will not be the way we typically have to go through encroachment permits and submit, wait three months, get a response, you know, wait three months. This will be ongoing. Uh, direct dealings with the design reviewer and the traffic person as well as the project manager and the right-of-way survey yeah. people. All right, then the, the, you uh, listed some items here. I just wanted to go over the uh, clarification of the scope and how the proposed improvements will need to stay within budget. And that's page five of five if, if you want to follow. But the question there is, um, again, we ask that council um, be brought back into that discussion. So uh, I'm not looking forward to somehow some way you coming back to us saying well um, we didn't have the money so therefore we re we designed it this way and do you approve it I'd like the conversation to start before we reach that level so um, um, if if council's in agreement are um, I'm just stipulating that it should be that way communication yeah. that we need the communication that we don't want something thrown back in our face and say and by the way you need to make this approval tonight because we need to get moving on this by next week and, and the intention is to, as mentioned there, at 35, 60, 95 percent, the consultant will come up to that cost estimate and that design level and say, where are they estimating the money? Keeping in mind that engineers no, never like to be low bidder, so they always bid conservatively, but that's fine. And uh, certain items will be ejected or cut off based on the priorities that we've already reviewed. So there'll be a recommendation and review, recommendation from staff based on the previous input and the requirements of the grant and review with the council for agreement on that. Okay, and then Mayor, just two, two more questions and I'm done. Uh, the, the um, I, first of all, I wanna I say thank you for giving the transportation project and the outreach efforts. I, uh, there has been a lot of outreach. Thank you. However, <laughs> um, general public meetings, we had one on 9-20-18 and 9-29-18, general public meetings. Do you realize that there's no other general public meeting listed on this sheet other than those two? And that was in 2018. So my, my request in moving forward, especially on the Maricopa Highway, is that we conduct more public meetings and I would like to see those start as soon as we start the demonstration so that we can really get the input of the public on that part of this project it's it's in I think it's important for everyone that's sitting up here that we get that let me mention that the SCAG grant that we've applied for it's substantial right it's four hundred thirty thousand dollars but it is a, a full fix of uh, I'm sure they reduction. require those but yeah the outreach is part of it as well and 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 so um, so that's what I'm trying to say is out of all of all of this to actual although every time there's a council meeting it's a public meeting but I'm just saying specifically geared to public. There aren't too many of those and we need more. And then the um, mayor, the final question I had, and it was actually a pretty simple one, but I, let me real quick look at my notes. Um, and Greg, if you'll get lucky if I don't find it. Okay. Oh, here's one and I'm not looking for an answer, um, but I did ask you 10 times <laughs> one time who actually created the priority of these um, uh, phases. And I would really like to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and have you go over that with me rather than do it publicly. But I would really like to know who created the priorities because I just don't have a sense that we did. Um, I think we did. I, I just want to remind you that council used to be very definite that the, right. the crossing. Phase one, phase the pedestrian two. Pedestrian crossings, the, the bike crossings were of utmost importance and uh, to reduce fatalities and accidents on those areas. So those were 
reiterated by council through council goals, and then uh, the complete street master plan. They were already in the bike and ped master plan, so. Great. So um, you got lucky, I can't find my last question, so. Okay, well then moving right along, <laughs> you're welcome. Um, uh, do we have a roll, do we need a roll call on this for a contract? Uh, yeah, just a yeah, right, clerk, please. Councilmember Wyrick? Yes. Councilmember Haney? Yes. Councilmember Blatz? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Francina? Yes. Mayor Johnston? Yes. Okay, that brings us. Great job. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Go home now. <laughs> well, Greg, I just. It, it, is Get out there, of here quick. <laughs> quick, quick, go, no, no. go. Yeah. No. Is, there, is there currently an installation of a. It looks like there was an installation on the corner of uh, Kenyatta and O Avenue, right? That's going on right now. Yes, uh, the flashing That's beacons all. have been installed all four crossings yes, in Maricopa. Great, great. So that includes some additional median installations. So we've got flashing beacons. Yeah. And then actually, I didn't get out to see, but uh, it should have been Kenyatta and uh, Blanche. And then uh, I Park. used it. It's, Thank you. I just I want to let everybody know. I'm not quite sure if these yeah, three are up running, but I know the four are Hold it. I'm going to ask you a couple. Uh, <laughs> Are they're, they're removing the old ones, right? The, uh, the, the old pedestrian arrow that just pointed down because they've got the new one with the flashing right. light, right? Uh, and how long does the, do the pink-orange uh, flags fly up there on uh, Grand Avenue to direct on the stop sign? On the new stop Oh, on the Grand, uh, until uh, the sun decays the flag, <laughs> essentially. It's really best all indications are as long as you can leave them out there because somebody says, oh, I wasn't here for this summer I returned and I didn't know that was there. So it's better to go for months at a time. So approximately three months. I commend your people for working in 100 degree heat on those beacons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mayor, I have one more question regarding that, the, the same thing. For no. me? No, well, actually, to Greg, <laughs> you know, and I noticed this yes, um, actually yesterday, I almost rear-ended somebody. The interesting part about coming down that grade into Kenyatta is the fact that someone stops for a pedestrian and you don't see the pedestrian. So it's interesting. It'd be nice if there was a way of linking the light, the stop, the walkway light at Kenyatta to something at the top of the grade. What's the street by the liquor store? Did you set me up for this or not? I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm just saying, okay. I, I would think that if we could link something together there, we're warning that person up mm -hmm. there that someone else is walking down below. Okay, um, so I, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, just to throw in, and I, I, didn't, I probably owe you five bucks for this one, but there is, it may not be operating right now, but it should be operating Wonderful. Thank immediately. You. So there's one on each side of the crossing, and there's an advanced. You'll see a new awesome. steel post. That's great. Okay, and, uh, that like minds think crossing. alike, <laughs> Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Look right. at that. Look at Randy giving you the love. <laughs> see, aren't you glad you stuck brother. around now? Okay. Now turn and run. <laughs> okay. Okay. We are at that five dollars. I know. We are at reports, and I'm going to go around once. So, uh, do you want me to start at the other end, Randy, or do you want to? Are you ready to? What are we doing? I'm not coming back for your report. If you wave it. As long your, as it's just reports and it's not um, agenda requests. That's I correct. Have that's report. agenda requests we do last. Okay. You have nothing required to report, Ryan. How do you? Uh, I was at the Air Pollution Control District meeting. There was not a ton of new news. Uh, or things are moving forward, and that's about it. The uh, if there is any, uh, we, we are working on. I'm, I'm, I'm lobbying for us getting as many EV electro, electric stations as we can up here, and Great. and we're going to continue to look at that. Uh, the only other thing is, I had a report from uh, my neighbor and as well as at my own home that um, this last weekend there were Greenpeace people who had come to our homes and they knocked on my neighbor's home so loud that their 12 year old son hid in a closet, called his mother, his mother called me to see if I was home to go do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, my girlfriend had the same people come over to our house because we're neighbors. She was harassed. She asked them to leave three times. They wouldn't. They wouldn't take no for an answer about for signing what? them up. Uh, they were just trying to sign people up and ask for donations for Greenpeace. And um, we were very, it, it was, it was, it did not go very well. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, if there's anybody else out there who experienced this, or Greenpeace is a great organization, but the, uh, what transpired was really a little bit disturbing. And I've heard, uh, I actually heard another report of something similar in the area. I don't really know what was going on because I wasn't there, but I want to make sure that if anybody is aware of anything going on and um, I, I'm hopeful that we're, we're going to, I um, think we're going to, uh, 
Uh, yeah, Chief, I want to make sure you heard that too. And it, it was just really kind of bizarre. And like I said, I, I don't think it's uh, an organization. Well, I may have been a bad apple or a bad experience, but they, Green you know, it happened to multiple people, and it was a okay. Let's hear from the, the Greenpeace. Uh, the, uh, the, the question was: Greenpeace was soliciting funds and pounding on people's doors, intimidating apparently, and refusing yeah, to I mean, leave. Have you heard anything about this? I, I did not hear anything about that, but I can, no, I also, I can, and I, and I I can look into it. Yeah, well, I also heard, too, that they were in other parts of the town where they were fine, where they were great, and they, I think they were maybe different individuals. But there was this situation that occurred uh, near my block, and it was, uh, I was a little disturbed. I mean, these people, I mean, not only my girlfriend, who was at my house, say the same thing, but my neighbor, very reasonable people, uh, were were pretty offended you asked, they, you asked them to leave and they didn't yes uh, my girlfriend said I'm not signing up today thank you you can leave and they were forceful again forceful again until she finally just walked away from them and said that's enough and she had no idea of what had transpired at my neighbors and my neighbor was was very freaked out her, her 12 year old son I, literally hid in a closet because they're banging on the door so hard and um, it was you know I I, I they asked me not to share who it was, but they, but I did, they did tell me I could share the situation. And, I, again, I don't want to – Greenpeace is a fantastic organization, uh, but like any other organization, if you have some bad actors, you got to deal with it. So I think it's just important to let everybody know. I think you yeah. should tell the organization. That's, so, that's part of the plan. Yeah. And then yeah. find out if it yeah. was them. We, <laughs> there we'll, are people we'll take some who steps. give other people bad names. And right? also, you know, for people to know that are still watching, right, they can call us, yeah. right? If you have somebody that's – that's acting that aggressive, that in an aggressive manner that just close and lock the door and you call 911 and you tell them that there's somebody at your door, you don't know who they are and they're refusing mm -hmm. to leave and we will come and investigate it. What's mm -hmm. a, in, in general, what's our solicitation policy? So First, mm -hmm. Amendment, well, first Amendment, the sorry, First yeah. Amendment protects charitable solicitations. Right. It does not protect aggressive behavior. It does not protect pounding on doors. It does not protect remaining on property after being asked to leave. It does, however, protect the first ask. The knock on the door, hi, would you like to donate to whatever? That's right. protected, but not everything else. Yes. Yeah. So common. we'll reach out to the organizations, uh, this one, and A, confirm whether it was their people or something else, and B, as noted, um, the 911 is, is, I think, perfect for that kind of a call where you've got a person on site on the property. Short of that, the non-emergency number is also available. Okay. Well, now that we've heard that it's out there, uh, the city manager will keep an ear to the ground and bring it back if we have a further incident. Yep. That's in the meantime, p people should know they could call regardless who it is that's pounding in a, an aggressive way on their door. <laughs> and definitely thank you for the call us, number. right? That's what we're yeah, that's right. what we're here for. And and think people sometimes are afraid to call because they think we're busy, which we are. But the reality is we prioritize the calls. So if they're on something that's not as much of a priority, we can always go back to that and then handle the priority call. So if we're at a, at a, a report that's an old report, let's say a, a vandalism that occurred a week ago and we hear a call go out, we will leave the vandalism call and tell the person, I apologize, I have an emergency call I need to go handle, I'll be back. And that's how we do it. Okay, uh, as far as, let's see, do you have any council report you'd like to make? Uh, no, okay. not really. Then you don't have to, I'm that's been, okay. We, thank stifled. you for that, we appreciate that. <laughs> I wanted to, to commend your uh, department. Uh, I've seen an increased number of walking patrols recently and They've been interacting very well with the community, and I just want to, I, I just, you know, so it's really a nice chemistry that results from the way they're handling themselves and that walking patrols. Thank you very much. I'll pass that along. Thank you. So I appreciate Was there a motor that. officer, uh, a motorcycle officer in town today? Do you have any from the department? We, we have a, motor a motorcycle officer who lives in the area oh, and okay. does not work out of this station, but lives here, so he rides his motorcycle to and from. Okay. Um, we did have a motorcycle officer up here to uh, lead off the mountains to the beach marathon as well uh, to, to, to start that off. So we had them up for a quick tour the, last week. One other quick report, uh, you know, I sit on the Ventura Regional Sanitation District Board and right now we're right at the uh, notice of preparation stage for the EIR to finally um, move ahead with the uh, modification to the conditional use permit for the toll and landfill to take it from now until it's full. And that is the only publicly available um, solid waste uh, disposal uh, alternative for the county. Uh, the only alternative is waste management, you know, private. And right now, for example, half of Oxnard solid waste has to go further than it should have to if we uh, can succeed in modifying the uh, conditional use permit. So there's an attempt to be environmentally responsible and, uh, and also maintain um, the, uh, the, the sense of serving the public good uh, with this, uh, you know, with this, uh, what amounts to a, a, a you know, a, a public utility rather than a, a, a private corporation handling this. So okay. that's uh, just about to happen. 
Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, we are now, uh, Randy, uh, it says future agenda items. Is that I so? just wanted to, to um, uh, clarify that we are going to bring back the uh, the speed humps. Right. Yeah. I was gonna, uh, I'll uh, meet with James and we'll put it on the agenda at the, at the earliest possible date without overloading things. I think possibly the 25th is a bit yeah, soon. Uh, it, I just think they've they've asked for it. And I thought I uh, I think we had agendized it. We're just leaving it up to the city manager to figure out when's the best time for it. I just wanted to follow up on that. And then the uh, um, if you can let me recall something in a in a minute. I'll Are we pass, on future agenda but, items now or not? Yeah. And I had one other thing. I just can't. It's, I'm drawing a blank on it right now. Regarding what Randy just mentioned, uh, can you have Public Works uh, identify? I, I think I know what they mean by the pads because yeah, I've seen them up in Westwood uh, and the way they're designed. But the cost mm -hmm. uh, and what is the recommended? So because it, you know, once we start this, we we need to, and maybe as a partnership with neighborhoods. But I know down where where I live, there aren't very many houses there. But the uh, people coming from a dead stop at the stop sign down there uh, on the south. <coughs> Montgomery, mm -hmm. will peel out and pass the person in front of them, mm -hmm. or when the person in front of them starts down the hill, they will pass them in the opposite lane, and the velocitation or whatever you guys call it <laughs> coming off that hill is extraordinary. Uh, so, yeah, maybe by uh, our budget conversation, we at least get some idea of the magnitude of right. what it would cost to yeah. do you know, what's, you know what's interesting about that, Mayor, in the same light? I w was working on Montgomery, let's say, two months ago, and I didn't, I couldn't realize how much speeding goes on there. And it's the same thing when I worked on Kenyatta. Kenyatta, to me, is is a horrible street, is because um, there's more children on Kenyatta going to and from school most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there's just streets that people don't come and tell us about that are problems. So it's good for the drowned people, and maybe more people will will rise to the occasion. Okay, uh, Ryan. Well, I, I used to live on Summer and uh, <laughs> Kenyatta. Yeah. Is there a bench over there, too, where yeah. you were sleeping? I just, I just want to mention it is uh, a lot of people peel it out around there. Were you in Savarro's place? Just, just let you know. <laughs> just, just let everybody know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, are we on future agenda? Or? Yes. Yeah, we are. Uh, well, I would just like. Do you attention. have anything that you were? Uh, no, I just want to make sure, along with Randy, that. We do get drowned on before we have our summer break. Yeah. Okay. And we, we, we are meetings, working so. on it. Two, so. more, two more meetings. Mm -hmm. We are working on it. So it is coming back. It's just oh, nailing down which that. meeting. Yeah. Okay. Bill? Uh, yeah, I would just like to cons you know, see if there's support for some staff research and possible future agenda for looking at um, uh, modifying, bringing up to speed of the parcel tax for cost of living adjustment for a library. And making sure that that if we do that and the county doesn't that that money would go just to our library inside the city limits and not otherwise I just like to kind of know if that's an option also I'd like to look at a, a study of, of you know we're a landlord for outdoor dining areas and I think we ought to look at charging rent for outdoor dining space uh, modest I'm not talking about e excessive but I just I'd like to see a report on that and also I, I still would like to see at some point what the cost is for maybe using HDL if they do this service of looking at our, our property tax assessment roles, um, seeing whether the county is treating us fairly and to what extent we need to look at um, people who have done conversions for uh, living areas that are not being assessed. Yeah, the last item is one that has real potential and for fairness as well as income. So, okay, uh, Mr. And in Mayor, I think I was, I had the last one was the assessment district. Just getting back oh, to us on, on, the zones. On, on the zones and so that we can all understand where they are and so that we're um, give neighborhoods the option right if they want. Yeah. And, and then the other thing too is on the same on that same light um, there are light fixtures that are out um, so so we just need to state publicly that we contact Greg Grant to have those fixtures repaired okay okay Okay, I skipped over, but I'm going to come back to our new city manager and have a. <laughs> so, uh, congratulations actually, and condolences. Mr. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Future agenda item getting your name tag with the interim <laughs> off of yeah. it. Yeah. I don't have much. The one thing I sent an email out this weekend, but I figured now is a good time to reiterate. So, um, 
Skag has released proposed RENA distribution uh, methodology. Yeah. Um, we are reviewing that. We're going to bring a um, bring information to council about um, possibly commenting during the public comment period, which is expected to be July of 2019. Okay. Thank you. And I'll just add on that one that we're also taking a look at those uh, with the cost sharing across all our SCAG cities to take a look at it from the planning and the legal perspective, given the importance of the RENA program. Did you say 2019 or 2020? Uh, public comment is next month, July 2019. Yeah. Okay. And I would like to conclude by uh, commending all three of our people present for the response times of, uh, to both the council and the community. that. Uh, it's been, and we're in a transitional period, and it's been very helpful. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. We stand adjourned. Let's, let's go get on our dinosaurs. <laughs>